This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after ten is the time. Um, oh, all right then. Do you know what it's like? This must be like what Tom Jones feels like when everyone just wants him to sing Delilah and he's got loads of exciting new material to, to share with you. Sing Delilah! I, 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 yesterday we did go back in time and start examining with the help of carefully curated clips some Brexit-related shenanigans. Um, and it was, it, well, it was surprisingly uh, successful, wasn't it? I, I don't think anybody now can pretend that they weren't lied to by Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg and... Uh, Andrea Leadsom joins the list this morning, so I will indulge you briefly. This is not going to be the topic of the first phone-in today, but I am prepared, partly because Andrea Leadsom plays such an important role in my own analysis of Brexit. You will have heard me share with you the very moment I realised, A, that we were doomed, B, that the British media was complicit in allowing liars and charlatans to go unchallenged, sometimes unwittingly, and see that I would no longer be able to work at the BBC, which was, uh, on, on a personal level, quite troubling. But I accept that in the great scheme of things, it wasn't as important as the imminent national catastrophe and the epic failure of broadcast media to hold the liars and charlatans to account until it was too late. I'll tell you the story briefly, because you've probably only heard it several hundred times already, or indeed read it. I think it pops up in at least two of my three books. I was presenting a programme when the Farageist fringe of British politics started shouting about, let's go WTO. The people who, who, who understood nothing and cared less always had a few slogans up their sleeve. It, it, that, partly to disguise the fact that they were obsessed with foreigners. That's gone well for you lads, hasn't it? Bringing down immigration by leaving the European Union. Nice work there. Well played, everybody. Carry on. Uh, or just to, to, to sort of distract from the fact that they didn't understand anything. So they would, they would shout things like, make Britain great again or take back control. Um, and then latterly, of course, get Brexit done. But of course, anybody who did understand things knew that let's go WTO was a statement of such extraordinary imbecility that it was a miracle anybody who was prepared to say it out loud in public was allowed near scissors. But there we are. Andrew Leadsom uh, plays a part in this moment of mine. I, uh, I was presenting a programme when... Pascal Lamy arrived in London. Pascal Lamy, a former director general of the World Trade Organization. This stuff's important, you know, especially for people who care about the truth and care about the country, although I fully accept there's lots of people who care about neither. Increasingly so, as the reality, the truth of what you did, what you ushered in, what you voted for becomes unavoidable. So I thought, correctly, that what the best person you could possibly talk to about what let's go WTO would actually mean, what World Trade Organization rules actually involved, and how feasible or wise it would be to go out into the great wide world without any free trade agreements at all in place, something that I think had possibly been done by Mauritania once, but I, that had something to do with the civil war. It had certainly been never, under, never been undertaken enthusiastically by any country in history. So I said to the producers of the programme, I thought, that's fantastic. How long can we get with him? How long can we get with Pascal Lamy? Can we, can we drop the weather or, or, or whatever it might have been? And uh, someone said back to me, yeah, well, obviously we'll need another guest as well. So I said, why? Why will we need another guest as well? And they said, well, someone will have to put the other side of the argument. This was the BBC. And I think at the time... I can't remember whether Robbie Gibb was still running political programming or whether he'd gone to be director of communications for a conservative prime minister before coming back as a member of the board and lecturing people like Lewis Goodall on impartiality. Yeah. Uh, so I said, why do we need someone else? To go? And I said, well, we need balance. And I said, but he ran the World Trade Organization. Said, How do you balance that? I literally just want to ask him questions about the World Trade Organization. Who do you balance that with? Someone who's never run the World Trade Organization and knows nothing about it? And they sort of said, well, yes, we'll, we'll have to get someone on who will say that Pascal Lamy, the former director general of the World Trade Organization, doesn't really understand what World Trade Organization rules are and why it would be a really good idea for the UK to, to leave under WTO rules. And I thought for a moment, for a nanosecond, I thought they were joking. I thought they were joking, but they weren't. So I said, OK. Well, I still think we should have him in the studio for as long as we possibly can. Who, 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 who are you thinking we could get on to tell the former director general of the World Trade Organization that he doesn't really understand what the World Trade Organization does or is? Who, who do you think might be qualified 
to do that. And you know what the answer was? All together now? Andrea Ledsom. Andrea Ledsom. It's impossible almost to recall the hysteria and madness that the country was caught up in, um, reaching a point where it briefly looked as if she might become prime minister. The, the, the failure to challenge these liars and idiots, and I, and I don't use those words lightly, but I use them accurately. The failure to challenge these liars and idiots has taken us to where we are today, ushering in economic sanctions, um, tariff-free friction at our borders as a direct consequence of listening to the people who insisted that that was never going to happen. So I, I sat in a studio, I, I quizzed Pascal Lamy, a lovely bloke, about all of the ramifications of, of World Trade Organization rules and the reality of what leaving without trade deals would, would mean for the United Kingdom. And then I said, thank you very much, Pascal Lamy, former director general of the World Trade Organization. And I had to pivot on my chair. I used to love pivoting on that chair. It was really nice. You sort of turn like this. And I had to say, Andrew Ledson, you disagree. And she just started saying words, making noises that sounded like words. And the... Um, and the, the, the reaction of, of Pascal Lamy was extraordinary. I, I, the director actually caught it on camera. He did that sort of curly-whirly cuckoo thing next to his head while she was talking, I think. And, and that was the moment when I thought, I can't do this anymore. Because on LBC, I could come on air and say, Andrea Ledsom is talking absolute rubbish. But on the BBC, I had to treat her as if she was an equal and opposite authority on the World Trade Organization to the man that had, until relatively recently, actually run the World Trade Organization. And that is why the country is where it is today. And, of course, for the fa racist Farage fans, you don't even get to say, well, it's worth it anyway because we've brought down immigration. Uh, yeah, you would now be arguing, it's great that I can't get my mum into a care home. It's great that I get, you know, the, the local CAF is shutting for three days a week because they can't get the staff. Oh, it's fantastic because we've got fewer, fewer <sighs> immigrants coming here. So there it is. And Andrea Leadsom is still in government. I'll say that again because it's extraordinary, right? She's still in government. And today she's giving interviews like this one. Again, there are big opportunities from free trade deals. We, we have huge trading arrangements with the United States. As I say, we've signed up to the this Trans-Pacific Partnership to other free today, trade though, deals. Well, actually, businesses always face the cost of doing business. Businesses knew at the time of Brexit that in leaving the European single market, there would be additional checks at the border because by definition, we were no longer in that single market. There was no surprise about that. I can certainly remember as business secretary myself back in 2019, every day meeting with businesses, round tables to help them to prepare for us actually leaving the, the European Union and, and to understand the additional checks that would be required. So businesses are used to the costs of doing business. I understand that today is a big news story because it's something that finally has come home to roost. But the fact of the matter remains that businesses have huge opportunities with other parts of the world, which are the direct benefit of us leaving it's the European about, Union. With all due respect, it's not about it being a big news story. It's about the small businesses that it's going to impact. We're speaking to a florist later on who will not be able to afford the flowers coming from Holland because she can't afford the checks that are going to have to be done and the increase in flowers as a result. And as I say, leaving the single market was always going to have implications. But what would you say to her and those trade. like her? Um, so what I would say, I mean, I've had many constituency cases over the years of people who've changed their trading arrangements with the European Union as a result of different frictions, whether it's postal cost changing, whether it's um, border so controls and Europe, so on. Is that what you're no, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that businesses need to adapt to meet the changing environment. There are huge opportunities so from the rest do? of the world. Well, I don't know her particular circumstances. She can't afford the flowers that, and the extra increase that it's going to cost her to get the checks before she brings them over from the Netherlands. So there are many parts of the United Kingdom that are flower growers themselves, and there are other parts of so the world. So she shouldn't buy from Europe. That's well, what you're saying. I'm not saying that at all. I'm well, just you saying are. I don't know her exactly circumstances. What you're and obviously, what some businesses will do is continue to trade with the EU and absorb those costs, and others will choose to find access from elsewhere. 
So you, you heard that, right? Andrew Leadsom, currently a Minister for Health, a health minister, saying that everybody knew that leaving the European Union would mean leaving the single market. Everybody knew that it was going to involve more costs for businesses. Everybody knew, because she was one of the people telling them, that there would be friction less tar- uh, tariff-free friction coming in at, at our borders and that British businesses would have to find more money to buy the same stuff that they were buying for less money before. So you're absolutely clear. You heard Andrea Ledsom say that. I think she said it on LBC as well. Um, that was Kay Burley interviewing her on Sky News. So who's this woman then in, in 2016 pretending to be Andrea Ledsom? Let me get this right. You're claiming that we could leave the EU, we could, which will mean because you've made a big song and dance about it, ending free movement of peoples, that would not apply to the United Kingdom, but we would still access the single market on the same basis as we do now? We would continue to trade tariff-free because it's in their interest, oh. even more than ours. And just to be clear... So, but, but let, no, let, let me try and get you to be clear, because it's interesting. On the same basis as now... We would trade on the same basis, it will is be your claim. Absolutely, in their interests, even more than ours, we have a big deficit with the European Union. And let's be clear, the EU has some modest free trade agreements with the rest of the world, not nearly as many as Switzerland, sure. but they do have some free trade agreements. Those countries trade tariff-free with the EU, and they do not have free movement of labour. No, so but... to suggest that the only way to access the European market tariff-free is with free movement is right. simply not true, Andrew. But if... if uh... Europe was to agree that there would be no price of membership for being part of the single market. There's no free movement. We won't be uh, part of the single market. No, but but you're saying we'd have the same access access as if we were. No, we... Well, well, I asked you if it was on the same terms. No, the single market has become a big totemic issue. We do not want to be in the single market. We want to trade tariff-free with the European Union. But but in terms of trade, we'd have the same access as we do now. I believe we will trade tariff-free. So if the European Union conceded that to us, what would stop Sweden, Denmark, Poland, other countries saying, we'll have that too then, if the Brits get that? The European Union elite is never going to agree to that. You know that. Andrew Neil there, just letting his mask slip towards the end when he started using the word elite, an indication of what was likely to happen a few years later when he got terribly high on his own supply and founded GBBs uh, while insisting that it wouldn't become a a, a right-wing reality dodging sewer. Bless his little cashmere socks. But Andrew Ledson more pertinently insisting that we would retain identical access to the single market to, to what we had before leaving. And now she's saying, you knew all along, you knew all along that there were going to be problems and costs. I don't think you want another hour on that, do you? I, 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 I don't start shouting Delilah at me. I'm not Tom Jones. I don't think you... Because we've covered it all. Some people have found the interview I was referring to a moment ago on, on uh, YouTube, so I'll tweet you a link to that if you're desperate for your fix on this. But I don't think we can go back to doing it every day like we did pretty much every day from, uh, from June 2016 onwards. Uh, and not least because we're looking at the... Uh, the road ahead rather than the road behind. And Keir Starmer's road ahead has has just popped up some potholes, I think, specifically in the area of, of support from Muslim people. And I, I don't like to speak about any block as a, as a sort of homogenous blob, but there are um, uh, there are good reasons for talking about the, the, the Muslim vote being traditionally more Labour than Conservatives. Um, well, possibly not anymore. He, he could have a big problem, uh, a Gaza-shaped problem, and we will find out, A, how big that problem might be, and B, what Keir Starmer could conceivably do about it after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 20 minutes after 10 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, I, I don't... I don't want you to think for a minute that this is to be filed under smear Keir, OK? Uh, the New European front page takes up the smear Keir campaign this morning in spectacular fashion and, uh, and contains inside the newspaper a, a really good and detailed explanation of, of the efforts that the right-wing media are and will put into accusing Keir Starmer of all sorts of things. I fully expect the Daily Mail to splash soon on the fact that he doesn't put the toilet seat down after he's done a wee in it or some or or that he's very bad at stacking the dishwasher he, he lumps the knives in with the forks uh, you know, that, that, that smear care is a feature on this program that dedicates uh, a, a modicum of attention to trying to demonize him for buying a field so that his mother could care for distressed donkeys or indeed eating a curry once 
uh, in Durham in contravention of precisely zero rules? Or, or I mean, what are the other examples of, of smear care that we've come up with quite a lot recently, haven't we? But this isn't that. Not least, uh, and this is a slightly simplistic way of proving it, but um, th- 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 number one, it's not an opinion, it's counting. And number two, it's in The Guardian, which which is... Um, which is, as you know, traditionally a, a, a left-leaning newspaper, traditionally a Labour-supporting newspaper, not Labour-supporting in the sense that the Daily Mail is Tory-supporting. Um, the Guardian, as is, as is the curse of liberal media, will criticise its own side, uh, or as, at least as robustly as it criticises the other side, while the other side, of course, get a free pass from their own client journalists in, in the media in all sorts of positions, including being an executive board member of the BBC these days. But hey-ho. So it can't be filed under smear care. And, and the second reason why it can't be filed under smear care is because it does involve counting, not opinions. Labour sources have told the newspaper that the party is running polls and holding focus groups around the country after senior officials became concerned that they were hemorrhaging support among Muslim voters. Um, Keir Starmer's office, the article on the front of today's paper states, has begun polling British Muslim voters amid growing concern in senior Labour ranks about the damage done to their core vote by the ongoing row over the party's position on the Middle East. Um, And I thought we'd conduct our own actual poll on this, if you like, or or, or focus group. It's more a focus group than a poll. I'm not going to keep count. But I am going to ask you this question. Do you find yourself surprised to to not be supporting Keir Starmer as a consequence of what you think he has done and said over the the Middle East crisis. Um, Leader's office being forced, I read, to rethink how it communicates with sections of the party who say they have long been been ignored. Um, So I I want to know two things, as always. I, I, I want to know whether you are in this category. I also want to know whether, as a British Muslim, you're not, whether you are clear on why uh, Keir Starmer remains your favoured option for, for the country's next prime minister. But I, I, I suppose in some ways I'm more interested in the problem than I am in the exceptions to it. And it is an issue of trust. It is a sense, a conviction that he has been slow in uh, supporting Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip and and too full-throated in his support for the Israeli offensive. Um, uh, There is profound concern, particularly um, uh, in in the Muslim community, about the Labour Party's failure really to to, to distinguish itself from the Conservative Party. And and I I get it. I, I think some of it started here, actually. Some of it started on Nick's show when Starmer was interviewed and uh, and, and said something about the ceasefire. And I was upstairs when it happened, and they, they were on the phone immediately saying, that's not what he said. That's Well, that is what he said. We've clipped it up and put it out, but that's not what he meant. It, it's, a, it's a disingenuous clip, but he said it. So I, I, I'm afraid we're bang to rights putting, putting it out as a clip. But the party was immediately, the leadership was immediately... Um, uh, 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 trying to undo the words that came out of his mouth and replace them with what he said he meant instead, which was slightly different. But it doesn't matter. This is politics. You don't get to do that. Uh, supporters of the last Labour leader might have screamed conspiracy or, or stitch up or scam, but I'm, I'm supporters of the current Labour leader, I'm afraid, don't have the luxury of cultish delusion and remain focused on getting into power, which is why this story is potentially quite a big problem for them. Um Nearly half of the country's two million Muslim voters chose Labour at the last election. A quarter didn't vote. Two thirds of those who did backed Labour. And it would appear that a lot of those voters will not do so next time. It it, it seems likely they won't vote at all rather than piling in on the Conservative Party. That would certainly be odd. But... um, 03456060973 03456060973 is the number you need. Why has what well, and it has to be relevant, doesn't it, to your to your Muslim identity, to your Muslim faith. It has to be relevant to your Muslim faith. So it, I don't want you to ring me and tell me why you've gone cool on Keir Starmer because of I don't know uh, him buying fields for his mum to keep donkeys in. It has to be something that is specific to your Muslim faith. 
and I want you to talk me through what it is he is doing, what it is he has done that means you don't currently feel that you will be able to vote for him whenever Rishi Sunak finally gets around to... Um, whenever R Rishi Sunak finally gets around to calling the general election that the country so desperately and obviously needs. So the number you need is 0345 6060 973, OK? And I just want you to talk me through why you, as a Muslim have lost faith or are losing faith in Keir Starmer. I also want you to tell me what he could do to restore your faith, to restore your trust, because that is the point of the polling. That is the point of the focus groups. Um, some of the areas of tension include comments by the shadow foreign minister, not secretary, a, a politician called Wayne David, who told the Jewish Chronicle that Labour would recognise Palestine only after negotiations between Israel and Palestinians had begun. David Cameron, the Conservative Foreign Secretary, has arguably gone further than that Labour foreign minister, which is certainly not a situation many people would expect to be ob observing. Um, David Lammy, the, the Foreign Secretary, uh, is meeting frequently with Shabana Mahmood, the Shadow Justice Secretary, who has become the sort of de facto leader of this, what the Guardian call this increasingly vocal caucus. Um, this is a problem for the Labour Party for two reasons. Number one, the electoral calculus. And number two, the simple case of unity. Have a look at what a, a, an ununified party looks like. You only have to glance across to the other side of the House of Commons, to which we'll be crossing live, of course, shortly after noon today for the latest bout of, of PMQs. But a, but an ununified, a, a, a split party is notoriously harder to govern than, than a united one. And one of the things Keir Starmer has been really exceptional at since becoming leader is taking a party that was tearing itself to pieces. He had a parliamentary Labour Party that had absolutely no faith whatsoever in the leader. And so, I mean, an incredible state of affairs. How it came about is almost as surreal as what it led to. I explain it all in how they broke Britain. But he has been extraordinary, extraordinarily successful at restoring unity in the ranks and distancing the, the, the party of Keir Starmer from the party of Jeremy Corbyn. That's not an opinion, by the way. That's counting. You can be furious about the fact that he has been very successful in doing that and think that it's a terrible mistake, but you can't deny that he has. So you've got two problems here. You've got the problem of losing votes, which with a 20-point lead may not seem like a, a, a massive issue, but some of the target seats currently held by Tories would include areas that have a Muslim population above 10%, like Peterborough or Wickham or Bury North. And then the second problem you've got is the one of unity, which is why the second bit of my question this morning is, to me at least, at least as interesting as the first, what can he do to win you back? So are you losing faith? Have you lost faith? Talk me through exactly why. And what can he do to win you back? Is it too late, do you think? And what are you going to do instead? Are you, are you going to vote for someone else or are you not going to vote at all? It's half past ten and Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.34 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, uh, uh, Shalina Jam Mohammed wrote an excellent piece that I'm just reading now in the, the National uh, uh, up in Scotland under the headline, Politicians Cannot Afford Muslim Voters Being Disenchanted With Them, talking about how Islamophobia and the war in Gaza are going to have um, a, a big influences on elections on both sides of the Atlantic this year. So that, that could be on your reading list today as we turn our attention to to that question. The National, of course, being the Scottish-based newspaper, and speaking of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon um, having a bit of a nightmare at the moment and, and before the COVID inquiry in Scotland today where her WhatsApp messages will, as with Boris Johnson, very much be the focus of uh, inquiry. So we will take coverage of that after PMQs today. We'll take a, we'll take a catch up with our Scottish editor on what has happened there and um, just how hot the water in which Nicola Sturgeon finds herself might be. Still some questions, of course, hanging over why she quit the field when she did. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to wonder whether she was aware of some of the stuff that was likely to come out, uh, that is now coming out, coming out. But back to the question of why Labour voters um, uh, of, of a Muslim persuasion 
are for losing faith or have lost faith in Keir Starmer. Let's start with Sarah, who's in Hounslow. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hiya. Hello. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you, please forgive me if I get too emotional. Okay. Um, well, there's nothing so, to forgive. Um, there's, no, there's nothing culpable <laughs> about emotion, Sarah, yeah. especially not at this time. <laughs> um, so I have been a lifelong supporter of the Labour Party. I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you okay. and always voted Labour day one, always been passionate about um, um, politics since I did uh, politics and A-levels. And um, I seriously disliked the Tories till Cameron. Okay. And then after that, I hate them. I hate them with passion, this new lot. And yes. With with what they what they've done to the country, what they're doing to the country, the lies, the the corruption, um, that the fools they think we are, or the idiots they think we are, um, and yet, and yet yes. since for the last, and I didn't make this, I didn't make take the stance at the at the start of this crisis. But um, I, I have now, just around before Christmas, I made this decision that, um, and people all around me that I, that, that I was going to the marches with, yes. uh, friends and family, they were saying, saying from day one, where is Keir? What is he doing? Why is he on the side um, of the people of Palestine? Where is he? He's a human rights lawyer. He knows international law. What's going on? And yet I was kind of, I kept on giving him the benefit of the doubt um, uh, and, 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 but but now it's like what 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 kind of human rights lawyer are you? What are are you? And 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 how how can you not not see what's happening and not do anything? And also you're preventing the the people in your party from saying anything because there are they, they different people were saying supportive things before. And now they've changed their stance, and now they're just quiet. Or now it's just, you know, what 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 does Israel have on him that he cannot see humanity? And I know you're saying Muslim vote, but it's, for me, it's just it's just humanity. Uh, yes, I, I mean so, the, the 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 story is about Labour specifically looking into the hemorrhaging of, yes. of Muslim votes. But you're quite right that that the attitude to Gaza will also be alienating traditional Labour supporters of all. Of all backgrounds, uh, religions, and ethnicities, what was the tipping yeah. point then for you? I don't know that you're being necessarily fair in saying that people who spoke out more have gone quiet, but it's possible you're paying more attention than I am. I know that eight members of the front bench resigned their posts in order to back the SNP's uh, King's Speech Amendment, explicitly calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. If, if yeah. he if he did that now, would it yeah. be too late? Uh, no. No. No, because I because I. I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still a Labour supporter. Yes. I'm not a Keir supporter. Okay. And and he has to go, and somebody else has to come in, who who has to have some humanity in them. That's that's for me what it is. If if he eats today, he asks for ceasefire. He asks the charity gets the charities back in. He mm. gets the water switched on. He he gets you know. Th- that's fine. I'll be I'll be back on your side. No, there's nothing this current Tory government can do because I've seen them. If this, this, I, what I believe is they're they're worse. It could be it could be even worse than that. But if I have to have to punish myself by getting Tories back in to let let Keir know that do not take my vote for granted. Then that's what I'll, then I'll, I will do. That I, I won't vote for Tories. So you no, won't, no, so you I, won't but vote I'll, 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 at all. But I won't vote for somebody else. I will. I, will, I won't. You know, not vote. I will have to vote. But um, James, if if I hope Come you on. don't mind. Okay. Um, so I'm worried I, now. I have been. <laughs> I'm. It's, it's, this is it's no disrespect. I have been listening to you. I'm a few years younger than you, but I've been listening to you for nearly the first day that you started on, on LBC. Yes. And because I, I have my own business where I work from home, whatever, so I, so I had that privilege, I'd had the radio on, and I've been listening to you. And, and, and I believe that, that we have grown up together. Oh, so I do I. Yes. That I know there's a buck have... coming, but I'm going to enjoy these words <laughs> while they last. OK, so... <laughs> We were idiots in our twenties, but we have grown up, and we have we have grown, and we have learnt, and we have we have witnessed and reflected, and we're growing, and 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 I believe we've done that together. 
But <laughs> here it is. I believe you're often late to the game. Now, whether you you're I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know you, but but there's so many things where you will believe something, then you'll change. Be it Boris. No, Brexit. never. No, 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 no. No, I'm not having that. You, you were a Boris supporter. No, you I wasn't. Were. I was not a Boris supporter. I voted for him to be mayor of London in 2008, and two weeks later, well, two, I, two I weeks later, two weeks later, yeah. he came on the yeah. program and absolutely disgraced himself. It went so badly that his own yeah. team said he could never come back on again. And if you think back to 2008, I voted for someone yeah. who was quite funny on the television against Ken Livingston, who was losing funny. the plot. I always found him despicable. But that's, that's fine, but you yeah. were paying more attention than I was, so I'm not having that. And I certainly never <laughs> changed my mind on Brexit, so I'm not having that. On right, Brexit, gloves are off now, mate. Start, I, I'm not having that either. No, no. So absolutely ridiculous. Off. I'm James O'Brexit. <laughs> I'm the most pre- anti-Brexit person you, in the country. You, you became, you became Mr. Brexit. You weren't from the start. You start. You always said, "Oh, is it this or is it?" Well, that? I have to is do it, that, not least because I was trying to juggle two balls and work for the BBC at the same time as well. But as soon as it became clear that they were going to let racism take us out of the single market because it was the only way you could stop freedom of movement, I was in yeah. the front line. Uh, you could, yeah, if you, you came st- to that. Lane. I didn't come to that Jeremy conclusion. Hunt. No, because Jeremy they didn't Hunt. do it. Because you until Theresa May, until Theresa May announced those red lines, it wasn't actually a matter of fact that they were going to do the really stupid stuff. So I'm not having that either. Carry on. <laughs> Jeremy Hunt, what are you going to say about him? You used to like him. They didn't realize what a, he who? was. Who? <laughs> I used to like him. <laughs> this is outrageous. Anyway, this, well, this is outrageous. Yeah. And on this one, I'm not late. I, 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 I can see why you think that I am, but I stand by my coverage of this. I stand by my full response to the original atrocity on October the 7th, because even then I was pointing out that there, that there is a case and a justification for a very, very robust response from Israel, a, a, a deadly response from Israel, but it is also possible that they will go too far. So the word proportionate did an awful lot of heavy lifting during that period, but by the end of October I was clear that it, it had already become disproportionate, Sarah. So I am, perhaps as you would expect, having grown up together, I am defending myself passionately against some of your accusations while, while silently acknowledging that there may be some truth in some of them. I suppose the main difference between me and you in, in this uh, in, with Palestine is I have been well aware of what's going on for years and years and and you possibly have been busy looking at everything else as well. well you may be right, Whereas, although I, it's yeah. been 20 years since I first started getting called anti-Semitic on a regular basis by people listening to my coverage of this issue sure. and, and, indeed, sure. and indeed Islamophobic, of course, as well. So yes. um, it is always... Can choppy. I say one last thing, please? I think you, I think you should. Okay, <laughs> so... Um, because I'm a I'm a big fan of literature, yes. and and what I what I never understood about what was happening in the in the 30s and the 40s was why were people quiet? Why didn't any more people say anything? Why were the why were these movies coming out and these parties happening when when what was happening was happening in Europe? And all my but the only thing that and that used to really upset me. And all I could think about is well, people didn't know, but now. People know what is happening, and why are they not doing The numbers are inarguable. The, the over twenty six thousand dead, half of them children. The professor who joined us yesterday describing what it's like to operate on a little girl who's half her face has been blown away, and um, somehow a lot of the media coverage in this country focusing instead upon the United Nations Refugee Agency, while more or less ignoring the um, conference this weekend attended by double figures members of the Israeli cabinet calling for. Um, Jewish people to move into the Gaza Strip and, and start, set, well they say settling it, uh, it colonising it would probably be a more accurate word. I don't like parallels with, with, with the 1930s Sarah, for, for obvious reasons and the, the, in, in questions of scale there are no parallels to be drawn but, but when hospitals are being blown, blown up, when soldiers are, are, are going into, into hospitals fully armed uh, to take out their enemies, then the conventions are being breached, conventions are being broken, and you're right, it's happening in in full glare. Uh, The problem is, just to clarify on this, Sarah, thank you so much, and that was a beautiful critique of the relationship between a radio presenter and a a radio listener, if, if, God forbid, the radio presenter is doing something right. But the the, the tale of the IDF members going into a hospital in the West Bank and, and killing three suspected terrorists, or possibly proven terrorists, it's very easy to to not think about it too deeply and say, well, good riddance to bad rubbish. But remember that governments designate what a terrorist is. 
really. Sometimes it's an international organization. Sometimes it's a domestic government. And that's why you have the rules in place. So, for example, the South African regime prior to uh, the end of apartheid couldn't have gone into a hospital and shot Nelson Mandela dead. This, this is what sort of conventions constitute. It's, it's what international law is. The British army couldn't have gone into the maze during the hunger strike dressed up as, uh, as prison soldiers and shot Bobby Sands dead because it was a PR... Um, uh, a disaster for the British government unravelling, the UK government. So that's why you have rules. It doesn't mean you're, you're supportive of the people being killed in any way, philosophically, morally or ethically, but you're supportive of the rules that mean you've got to jump through quite a lot of hoops before you can, before you can kill people, before you can have state-sanctioned state killings. And, and that's happened in plain sight in the last 24 hours. And, and I think Sarah's right. An awful lot of this stuff we would all have expected to... Um, elicit a rather more outraged response. And that brings us back to why people are losing faith in Keir Starmer over Gaza, particularly, but not exclusively, of course, Muslim people. 10.46 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.50 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, the uh, concern in Labour circles is that the party's position on the conflict in Gaza is hemorrhaging Muslim voters. I think that's probably true. And I also think it won't just be Muslim voters. And, and I don't think it should. Although, I mean, simply in, t in, in, in terms of the, the, the available options, I think Keir Starmer has actually handled this fairly well. And yet, I suspect that if I had a deeper allegiance to that part of the world for, for whatever reason I would share some of the misgivings so brilliantly articulated by Sarah just a moment ago the bit I couldn't remember from his appearance on LBC which was during Labour conference that the, 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 the argument that Starmer was was distracted or not really paying attention doesn't hold much water but but I can tell you that the minute the clip of him saying that Israel was right to withhold power and water in Gaza, which I think would be war crimes. The minute that clip went up, his people were on the phone saying, that's not what he meant, that's not what he meant, that's not what he meant. So I, I make of that what you will. But I, I did hear some people this morning suggesting that it was days before he clarified his position. It really wasn't, but he'd said it on air. So if it had happened on my show, there's no way the clip would have come down. Even if they said, that's not what I meant, that's not what I meant, that's not what I meant. So, you know, maybe that's pertinent to the conversation. I don't know. And I think there is a, a case to be made for arguing that when he was doing the media rounds that morning, he was um, expecting to be talking exclusively about the Labour Party conference that had just come underway. But if it was a politician that I don't like, I, I would not be... Uh, I would have no patience at all for these kind of excuses. So, you know, maybe this is me indulging in a little bit of mild footballification. I hope not, but I think it's possible. I think Sarah has introduced a period of self-criticism self and self-reflection that possibly is a little uncharacteristic for me. Let's ca crack on with the calls. We'll probably stay with this for a little longer than the first hour. Farah is in Southfields. Farah, what would you like to say? Hi, thank you for having me on. I'm You're really so nervous. I've never called in it's to anyone me. before. I listen it's to you all it's the time. It's only me, Farah. It's nothing to be nervous about. I know, but it's... You can, you anyway... Can, you can um, rip up my entire history live on air like Sarah just did a moment ago. There's, 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 oh, God, no, I'm not that fierce. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not that fierce. <laughs> Carry on. Um, so your question was, you know, has he, if has you're he a lost? Muslim yeah. voter, you know, are you going to vote for him? Or are you basically, you know, are you not voting for him? So but I'm 47. I live in, I'm very middle class. I've got mm. all that sort of piece there. I'm very lucky and privileged in that way. Um, and I voted for just about everybody, you know, since I was able to vote. Um, but I think having children and getting slightly closer to my faith, which is what the children have done. I've got twin girls in year nine. Um it's made me sort of look at how I vote yes. a lot more carefully. So not necessarily just about what's going to benefit me. And we're not going to talk about the private school thing with sure. labour and tax and whatever. But my children are privileged and they're able to do that. So again, I don't love labour, but I did vote for them for the last few times. Okay. And the reason I was looking at it again was that my children have a great quality of life. 
but the vast majority of children in, in, in our country don't. So what is it that's going to make a difference? Now, I do do volunteer work and I fundraise and I give my time, but what's really going to make the difference is my vote. And I look at Labour and they just have better policies. But I think they're a little bit vague at the moment. So my view was I'll give them my vote because I think they will make things better. But now with the way that Starmer has behaved and my my religion or my faith or who I am is all based on you look at people who are around you and if you can help them, you should do. There is a piece within our religion which says it's your duty to protest and march um, if you see injustice. And I've been on four of the seven marches and my girls have been on on two of them, uh, partly because I wanted to show them this is what a free country looks like and you can do, you know, this is what women are able to do and isn't this is what civil rights looks like. So it's very important. Um, so where I'm going with this is that the problem is with, with Starmer is that he's human rights lawyer and he came out with an absolute clangor on, you know, obviously on, on, on LBC. And I don't believe for a second he said the wrong thing because it did take him a while to correct it. And what that says well, to yeah, me... But you, I've, I've given you some inside information on that, which is that they were... Uh, 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 yes, that they called and said... It, it, immediately. I mean, b- b- while he was still in the building, they, they were they were saying that that clip's not fair, that clip's not what he meant. And then he did immediately, or, I mean, reverse it publicly the next time he was offered an opportunity to do so. He categorically reversed his position on, on the withholding of power and water from Gaza. But I'm not not for a minute pretending that he didn't say the words. So I'm not just basing it on that, just that point, though no, that was course. really shocking for me. Yes, because it was, because it's I a war crime. It is, but also, you know, the whole image of Labour is that they stand up for, every, you know, the, the average person, or the people who really can't, who, who aren't privileged and don't have all those advantages that I know that myself and my children have. Um, <clears throat> that was really shocking mm. to me. Um, and it just didn't... It just didn't ring true. And then there is the whole piece around the ceasefire. And just, I find his response up until, you know, has been really muted. Um, And just, it just reinforced, unfortunately, my idea that as much as I want Labour to be that party that takes care of those who do not have the opportunity or the means, you know, to look, you know, to take care of themselves... It just, I just don't believe him. And I just don't believe that when he gets into power, because he will be, he's going to be the next prime minister, that he actually cares about the minority vote because the Muslim vote is a minority vote. I appreciate there are there are constituencies where it will be just, but you're it not, much more you're, difficult you're, for you're, him. You're not feeling the way you feel because you're a Muslim. You're feeling it, what you've expressed is a humanitarian it is, position. It, yes, but being part of the, the humanitarian piece, the piece around looking after your community, yes. the piece around looking after people who are not as privileged as you. And this is not whether, this is not... No, I understand that perfectly. Religion. You know I do. You know that I is very much part of my religion. Yes. Um, and, you know, that that is core to our religion. Now, people have lots of views on Islam, but for me, it is about respect and family and community and looking after each other. And I just don't see that from him. Do you think and, it's you know, a calculation? He, Do you think it's a calculation, Farah? Do you think he is prioritising the votes of other people over the votes of, yes. of, of, of you? The, the Muslim, the Muslim vote isn't going to get you elected. It, it's not going to get. It, there's too, there aren't enough of us. Well, it's going to win there some seats. It's enough us. to swing some seats if 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 you if you hemorrhage enough votes in places like Bury North or or or, uh, or Wickham, uh, and in fact, West Streeting's constituency as well um, uh, it w- would fit into this category as well. It, it it might be enough to swing if people stay at home in their droves. It's enough to make a difference. I don't think people are going to stay at home um, well, you in their are. droves and. Uh, well, I'm going to. I'm going to vote for another party, not the Tories. No. Don't worry about them. No, I'm going to vote for the Greens because I, you know, I'm. I, Can I, I ask you a trickier else, question? So. I, I, you've expressed yourself an awful lot of compliments coming in for you and Sarah. Actually, it's almost as if people feel the quality of the callers is higher than the quality of the presenting on the program this morning. Ah. Can't possibly let that that be sustained for for much longer. But. It, when, when did it become an issue? Because you you couldn't. I don't think anybody denied Israel the right to respond 
violently and and lethally to the October the seventh attacks, and and the the, the slightly mealy mouthed use of the word proportionate, and I'm only criticising myself there, not anybody else who used the word, using the word proportionate without being able to define what it meant, but the sense that there was a there was a point at which it would become too much. There would be too much death. There would be too much response. That being the point where one would want more uh, explicit calls for a ceasefire. Where, 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 where was that point for you? Do you know? Well, the thing is that I grew up with friends who are Palestinian. Yes. One of my best friends is Jewish. Her father's a great supporter of, of Israel. So I have quite a, a broad view on these things. Um, so for me, I... I felt that this was coming um, over years and years and years. Sure. And the point where I think my views on Labour in particular changed and when I thought that they needed a, cease, a ceasefire yes. was pretty much a couple of days into it. Because okay, that this, isn't something, this isn't something that has just suddenly happened. It's not like... Um, oh, and can I just make it really clear? Yes. I've no love... For terrorist groups. Oh, I sorry, I forgot. Hamas I forgot to say anything. that, didn't I? That was, I'll get texts yeah. now. Do you no, condemn no. Hamas? Yeah, no. Yes, I condemn Hamas, okay. and all right. the rest of it, fine. So we've got that out of the way. And just to just to sort of make it clear, I was I was it was the early morning. I turned the TV on, and I just saw what had happened. That Hamas had fired all these rockets, and there were all these mm. innocent people who'd been killed and kidnapped, and children, and all the other atrocities. And I just literally burst into tears. And I'm not one of those that cries. Right. Um, and I just remember my mother coming in. She listened to me. Um, and she said, "What?" Well, and I said, this is what's happened. I said, they're all going to die. They're going to be annihilated. And I said, all these people have died already. Um, and just watching it sort of, you know, sort of... Meaning the, meaning the, the 1,200 um, Israelis, sort of 1,200 Israelis have died already, or 1,200 people in Israel exactly. have died already, and now thousands and thousands and thousands more human beings are, are going to die. We're, we're, we're over 30,000 now. So In the same corner answer, of the world. Yeah, in, in answer to your question, my immediate reaction was, Gosh. this has to stop. But then also I'm a human being, so I can understand why, you know, Israel has a duty to protect its citizens. Yes. Now, there's a lot of conversation around, well, they're an occupier. Do they have the right to claim self-defense? I'm not a lawyer. I don't know enough about this. Mm. I understand why it needs to uh, protect its citizens. Of course. But what I see is that, which is what I think a lot of us do, is that it's the innocent people who have really very little power who are dying. And so very early on, literally, I think on that thing, I was like, oh, my God, this is just going to get out of hand. Um, I don't know if that more. I'm because not because I've got a longer standing of this. Yes, I, mean, I, I do. I, I get sitting... that. I, I get that. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if that. The fear of what was likely to happen is it is is quite enough to say, and therefore I didn't want anything to happen. Oh no, I think that's all. It, we're we're very late. Exactly. I tell you what, for someone who was nervous, Farah, I, I, I sense that I'm going to have to pull the wire at this point because I'm two and a half minutes late for the news. No problem, but yeah, so I hope I've just you know, given you, a you, different you, perspective. No, you, that is nice, and a very, very important perspective. And there's no, just very, very briefly, there's no way back. If Starmer came out now with stronger words, it, it wouldn't be enough. It would be too late or not? Well, if he's a miracle worker and he was able to stand up to the Americans, and actually, for once in our country, we're able to do something independent from them, which is... Well, it wouldn't make any difference to anything, thing. would it, except in, 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 in domestic political calculus. The Israeli government he, is, isn't it, going to pay the blindest he, bit of attention to Keir Starmer calling for a ceasefire, or probably even Rishi Sunak, to be fair. I think, honestly, my, my mind is always open. I'm always looking at the positive. And if, he, if Starmer stood up and he said, there needs to be a ceasefire now, we are going to recognise Palestine as a state, you know, all that business with David Cameron yesterday... And there was something concrete that he could say how yeah. this, 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 you know, atrocity, all of it is terrible, was going to end. He would get my vote, vote. but it's not going to happen. Well, I've we don't know really that, but it, it seems unlikely. Um, thank you. That was a, a, a brilliant debut. I don't mean that in a patronising fashion. I'm just addressing the, 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 the nerves that you articulated at the very outset. I don't think anyone who 
tuned in 30 seconds after you started speaking would, would credit the notion that you were intimidated by the thought of doing so. Thank you, Farah. It's three minutes after 11. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Crazy times, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, the, the other topic that was up for consideration today, and which we'll probably get onto tomorrow, was the likelihood of a united island moving ever closer. This, according to the uh, first minister of of Northern Ireland, or at least the the leader of Sinn Fein, imminently to 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 um, to achieve that position in Stormont. She says, in historic terms, it is within touching distance, and I think that is a very exciting thing. I, I don't know if you can. Uh, track that back to Brexit. It certainly hasn't helped, has it? Um, yesterday we touched on Jacob Rees-Mogg, but, but, but many others were doing exactly the same thing, denying that Brexit would have any impact whatsoever on the uh, situation in Ireland, on the island of Ireland. Uh, quite spectacular levels of ignorance that Andrea Leadsom today on the interview rounds has done her best to, to match. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm carrying on with the conversation about the Labour Party's um, uh, problem with Muslim voters losing faith and and other voters as well of course losing faith over Starmer and his colleagues attitude to the situation in Gaza but I, how are we processing these headlines now I mean, literally Thomas what's there essentially reading out factual headlines that eight years ago you'd have had people screaming at you from the very top of the Tory party and right across the media if you'd said oh by the way that's going to happen People would have screamed Project Fear at you so loud that little bits of gammon-flecked spittle would have come out of their mouths and landed on your face. You'd say, so no, you do understand, don't you, that, that it's going to cost more to bring stuff. No, we need, they need us more than we need them. Project Fear, it's so bizarre. Do you know, I'm not even sure I expected it to be happening this quickly, even though I understood on some level that it had to. I think that the... I think that the turnaround is so profound that I presumed it would be incremental. I thought it would be stage by stage. But these are guillotines that are coming down. And, and one, one has come down already. Uh, you now need paperwork to bring stuff into this country from countries where you didn't need any paperwork at all. You just do. At both ends, you need checks. You need certificates. You need documents. And they swore blind that there would be no tariff-free friction. There'd be no friction whatsoever. I, they're not technically tariffs, I don't think, but they're costs. So, you know, it, under one definition of the word tariff, under the broader definition of the word tariff, a fee that must be paid to trade, there are tariffs. But under the technical definition of, of, of um, a free trade agreement definition of tariffs, there are not. But how? How does a country process this? I'd love to talk about this almost psychologically. And and listen, I know I tease you a lot, and, and I do, and I know you probably don't believe me when I tell you that I feel sorry for you, apart from the absolute headbangers still insisting that there is a brilliant Brexit, but it went to a different school. The massive majority of Brexit voters that I encounter, both on air and off air, are, are just, just, you know, normal voters who, who swung one way because of something someone said that they found quite persuasive. As Sarah has reminded us, I swung towards Boris Johnson to be mayor of London in 2008, a source of never-ending embarrassment. But it doesn't make me a bad person or untrustworthy or uh, or even right-wing. And lots of people voted for... I mean, how, why wouldn't you, given what the newspapers and various commentators and broadcasters and columnists were insisting was true? Those tiny little voices like mine going, no, no, this is this is going to... Project Fear! Project Fear! Stone him! Stone him! So what does the country do now that, that, it, that such violent rejection of opinion ruled the roost? You know, that was very much the atmosphere, the febrile atmosphere. Even the BBC failed. You know, question time, full of people shouting from the audience. They were just wrong. It doesn't matter how many people shout at the top of their voices that the moon is made of cheese. The moon will only ever be made of moon. And here we are. Thomas Watts reporting effectively in his news bulletins now. Um, the government has confirmed that the moon is made of moon. Having spent years insisting that it wasn't, it was actually made of green cheese. I don't know. how. I'm not even talking about it today. We did two hours on it yesterday, and I'm fascinated by this Labour Party um, panic, if you like. But my goodness me, we need. To, we, we are going to be talking. I wonder sometimes whether... Oh, is that it now? Are we knocking it on the head? But we're not, are we? 
I have to avoid the temptation to spend the rest of my broadcasting career saying I told you so. But I will resist that temptation because, as ever, we are motivated by concern for our country and, crucially, our country men and women, many of whom today are finding out that their livelihoods are being rendered harder. Their costs are being rendered higher. Their income is being rendered lower as a direct consequence of believing people that told you things were going to get better. Food was going to be cheaper. So as long as you weren't part of the rabid mob screaming all manner of abuse at people like me, we're cool. We're cool. And do you know what? Even if you were, I was raised a Catholic. I believe in repentance. As long as you go to confession, we can be, we, we can be all square. If you're still clinging to the idea... We only had one text yesterday, so it's all the fault of Remainers. But I imagine if this was the Daily Express chat room, there'd be rather more people like that. You can't start getting the country back on its feet until you acknowledge why it ended up kneecapping itself. 12 minutes after 11 is the time. Back to why you, as a, as a Muslim voter, and possibly this hour will broaden that out a little, um, are changing your allegiances specifically and exclusively because of the party and Keir Starmer's approach to the Middle East crisis. Uh, 0345 is the number that you need. Mohammed is in Peterborough, one of the crucial constituencies in this entire story. Mohammed, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, so mate. I am uh, 19 years old. I've never voted in an election, only last year's uh, local elections. Oh, yeah. Um, I voted Labour then. Um, I will not be voting Labour in the next general election with Keir Starmer as leader. And, and you, I mean, I have to say, why not? Um, so I think his whole stance on this conflict has been um, terrible. I think he, does, he lacks a moral backbone. And I think some of the policies that he's implemented within the Labour Party, um, for example, one thing that really stood out to me was yeah. Andy McDonald's and how he was, he lost the Labour whip. And if you look at the quote he used, he said, I want peace from the river to the sea. I don't see how that is controversial at all. No, I, I mean, it was, a, it was a curious period, and it's a really, really good example, actually, to, to, to support your thesis. He, he did call for peace. He did not call for um, a Palestinian state or, 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 or uh, you know, Muslim rule. He just called for peace from the river to the sea. That became very weaponized, didn't it? That um, that phrase. That was a pretty ugly period because some of us were pointing out that Likud, the Likud party, used a, a, an almost identical phrase in election leafleting. And Benjamin Netanyahu's objection to any form of a two-state solution long before the current conflict was not only well established, but also it's been argued a reason why he was quite soft on Hamas, who were also passionately opposed to a two-state solution. So the treatment of Andy McDonnell was pretty, was pretty shoddy, actually. Mohammed, I think you're right. Yeah, and also I think the way that they, um, the, they were whipped against voting for a ceasefire in the House of Commons, and um, I think that I think they finally realised that they can't just take the Muslim vote for granted. And I think Biden's having the same problem in America, where the, the Muslim community is really mobilizing. And for example, I know you mentioned West Streeting's constituency. Yes. There, there's an independent Muslim Palestinian candidate who's running against him. And I think they've finally realized that there are places where we can actually lose seats. Uh, what's his name? Uh, it's a woman. I'm not sure her name. Okay. But um, she's Palestinian and she's running against West Streeting. I've got, I've got, so I've got, I've got someone on the other line who is also standing against West Streeting as an independent in Ilford, oh. but it's not a woman. So I was about to introduce oh, okay. you. I thought we'd had one of those lovely no. little moments of the planets <laughs> aligning live on the radio. But so I mean, there, there you go. There's already the anti-West Streeting vote getting split yeah. in Ilford so North. I, but is is there anything that he can do to win you back, as it were? I don't think so. I think from the start, I was always a bit iffy with Keir Starmer because I, always, I thought he was bringing Labour into Tory light, honestly. Um, okay. Especially with the tuition fees and um, NHS privatisation and stuff like that. So I, I was I, always I, a bit listen, iffy. It's not, it's not the time, but if, 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 if it wasn't already 11.16 and, and we were not having a conversation very much about the Middle East, I, I'd, I'd, I'd come for you now like a rat up a drainpipe on, on, on those issues and and much broader 
clear blue water between where the Tories and where the Labour are. And in fact, I'm glad I'm not going to do that, Mohammed, because I may even end up patronising you because of your tender age. So thank goodness we're not going down that road. But on, well, on the Middle Eastern is, issue, on the Middle Eastern issue specifically. Even if he called for a ceasefire now, I would not support him because I think from what he's shown, I think he's just switched. If he does switch, I think it would just be to uh, placate or uh, to uh, to give uh, throw some bread, for example, to the Muslim vote. Yeah. And I don't think... So uh, it would look I, cynical. I don't think it, would look, it would look cynical yeah, and pragmatic, but not principled. Um, i just read you what Terry has to say. It applies to, to most of my callers to say. It goes, whilst heartfelt... Whilst clearly heartfelt, James, do your contributors realise that every vote not cast for Labour makes the possibility of a Tory recovery more likely? Just deal with that for me, if you would. Honestly, I think I've... I didn't do my GCSEs. I've dealt with what the Tory party can do for the last 15 years. Yes. And I think I still don't... I still wouldn't vote for Labour just because I don't think they're moral and I think they would just flip-flop. Yeah. And I... That's a big I, problem. I, just, I, I couldn't do it. That's a big problem for Keir Starmer, um, I, I, because I'm fairly confident that you are representative of more than one man in Peterborough. Those comments from Andy McDonald that Mohammed refers to are worth repeating. This is what he lost the whip for. We will not rest until we have justice, until all people, Israelis and Palestinians, between the river and the sea can live in peaceful liberty. And I do remember thinking at the time that that was an odd thing to get sacked for or to get suspended for, a call for, for, for peaceful liberty. I, I Listen, you can, if you want, extrapolate it into um, a, a controversy. Labour clearly did. I don't agree. Um, uh, being suspended from the Parliamentary La uh, Labour Party for calling for peaceful liberty seems, seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable basis for Mohammed to ar have arrived at the conclusion that he can't vote for the, for the man that did the suspending. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. This, this is a problem, isn't it? This is, I, I can tell you, Nick's phone lines were very busy earlier um, on this subject, and I, mine are always busy, but there is absolutely no shortage of, of people contributing to this. It's not scientific, but, you know, a lot of political conversations we've had lately, I felt you haven't had an appetite for. I told you this. I, I've said to you stuff because, essentially, we kept coming back to the same question of what the hell are the Tories playing at? Who exactly are they appealing to with their calls for homeless people's tents to be confiscated or, uh, you know, even even harsher uh, uh, treatment of refugees? And, and it became very samey. This is a new conversation. And if I was, and, and I know they will be listening, uh, Labour Party HQ, just as they listen at Conservative Party HQ, they have to listen um, in order to submit so many complaints. I'd be really worried. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, uh, where some of the reports coming out of Gaza with regard to famine are, even by the standards of what we've seen already, pretty har harrowing. CNN um, uh, reporting under the headline, we are dying slowly, Palestinians are eating grass and drinking polluted water as famine looms across Gaza. Um, I mentioned that partly because no hostages brought it to my attention just during that last break, but also because it's very much, as, as, as he points out, it's very much part of the uh, issue. Uh, you know, it's going to be hard for Starmer to win back trust now. I, I don't know how much he's lost. Um, yeah, we will broaden it out now, not, not just Muslim voters, but, but people for whom the Gaza position is a deal breaker on Starmer. I'm going to have to trust you when you tell me that you were on board before. I, I don't want... Um, uh, here's someone who's an example of someone who I'm fairly confident was not uh, ever likely to vote for Keir Starmer despite calling themselves a Labour supporter using the phrase Kid Starver as a nickname. It's very funny, isn't it? So that's not... I'm not interested in your opinions uh, because they never change. I'm interested in opinions that change and opinions that have changed and, and winning back support, winning back trust... It's going to be very, very hard. The question then is, how much has he lost? 24 after 11. And I do have, and I think this is because I'm... Um, uh, what's the word you'd use? Uh, I, I think this is because I am not as invested in some of these issues as you are. I, I, same with Israel. People who've got family or 
uh, historical links with Israel. I'm not as invested as you are. So I do I do find Terry's point about you do realise that every vote that's not cast for Labour is is good news for the Tories and look what they've done for the last 14 years. But but I, I also accept that if I was assembled slightly differently or I had sli- a slightly different backstory, then that would be drowned out by my concerns on this very specific single issue. Um, Mohammed is in Ilford. I think you are standing as, a, as an independent. Did you know that you, there were other independent MPs also standing? Hi, James. Um, I am aware that there are other independents standing, but just to clarify something that uh, was said on the earlier call, the other caller, yes. I'm standing in Ilford South. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon. It, it, I thought yeah, you were standing. So you're not standing against West Streeting. So against West Streeting is Leanne Mohammed. Right. Uh, she's the uh, young lady who's of Palestinian origin, and she's standing against him. However, we started together in terms of the movement that's now started uh, for independence and as a direct consequence of Labour policy and what Claire's been doing, started with the Open North, and we actually went to see a le- a Wes on this early on. So now you ask the question, you know, what's led up to this point, what's, what was the change? And it mm. wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. It wasn't no, straight I, I, away. I'm sure it, was it a, wasn't. It was a gradual journey. And in fact, um, one of the earlier callers said, sort of very much have gone on that journey with your program and with yourself. Gosh. Because from the 7th, when those atrocities happened, it was very much expected that Israel would defend its citizens, and rightly so, um, as has happened in the past. But what then emerged wasn't defense. What then emerged and was clearly different, starting with the speeches that were coming from the very top of the Israeli government, was profoundly different. The extent of that, not just rhetoric, but what's now gone into the International Court of Justice's uh, case that is South Africa. So you're talking about support, not just for the actions, which, of course, gets filed under where does proportionate end, but support for the administration itself, even as its rhetoric went further, perhaps, than... Than the than the situation on the ground would would have allowed. Absolutely, and so That's people really like here who really should have known better, given his own background, given his pre- previous positions, lawyer status, international yes. law, all of those things. That even uh, as you said, let's you know more information come to the table. You've you've explained how he did row back and said he didn't mean to say that. So even if you give him the benefit yes. of the doubt, and, and he's a lawyer, so you know it, it literally his job not to misspeak and not to get his words exactly. wrong. Exactly. Exactly. So, but even if you give him the benefit of that doubt, and at that point, people were giving him the benefit of the doubt, and this engagement with the Labour Party, they're going to see Wes and talking to Wes, who's, who's a prominent person within the shadow cabinet, Very much so. potentially, you know, earmarked for future success, so we say, maybe not, a future prime minister. Yeah, sure. Um, so that engagement was very much about giving the feedback of the community, and bear in mind when uh, Wes got in, in 2015, I think it was, it was very much... Um, a conservative seat that went to Labour, and a lot of the support there was Muslims, Muslims who'd moved into the area. And I think now he's got a, uh, about 5,000 majority there. So this is very much the, a, a big number of people who live in Ilford North talking and saying, look, we're not comfortable with what's happening. More needs to be said, even if it's about you know, picking up what is being said in Israel, so it's, you know, government leadership. So it's not too late. And it, I mean, I, I, I find it remarkable that some members of the UNRWA uh, uh, charity being involved apparently in, in despicable conduct can be taken as evidence that the whole organisation is, is is dodgy. When you have 11 members of the cabinet, as I'm sure you know, attending this Victory of Israel conference at the weekend where um, uh, uh, all manner of statements were made and, and people in attendance included um, uh, leader of a, of, a, of, of, a, of a previously banned far right group, eleven cabinet ministers at yeah, this uh, yeah. at this conference, calling for the voluntary migration of the Palestinian population to somewhere else in the world and, and the settlement yeah. of the vacated territory by by Jewish people. So I, I do understand the context in which you're speaking, but I know you also speak as if there is room for rapprochement, Mohammed, as if I, I as if think, he can undo some of this damage. Yeah. So I, I think in politics, because you know, reaching out talking to others, finding the middle ground is important. And because that's not happened, it's literally been ignoring. What's now happened is that the community, um, and it's beyond the Muslim community, has decided that we actually need to to show and demonstrate through our vote the difference that makes. So for myself, it it got to the point where with his ongoing decisions and then that other decision that you mentioned, oh, we're not going to recognize the state of Palestine until Israel do, 
who themselves are saying we're not having a two-state solution just seems ludicrous. It just seemed even further, going further away. Well, I from think I th- that, that was that was the shadow Welsh secretary, wasn't yeah. it? The shadow foreign minister Wayne David. I think Lammy has has, has has kind of, or at least he's tried to undo that. I think, and I know that he has certainly spoken in the last twenty four hours on the importance of Israel abiding by the instructions of the International Court of Justice, which so far it doesn't look like doing. It doesn't look like it has done. So so there are grey areas here, and that perhaps is where the where the room for a climb down comes from. So just, just to clarify, because I'm late for the news, yep. have you been unimpressed by Wes Streeting's response to your tr- entreaties? I have been unimpressed, right. but what that's led to is that in Ilford South, so Leanne is standing in Ilford North, right. I'm standing in Ilford South. Ilford South, we have Sam Terry, who has actually been speaking about these issues, but unfortunately, he's been deselected within the Labour Party right. and someone else is standing. So now that leaves it open because, you know, everybody else is following the three, you know, party But you, you are going to split his vote. So briefly, how are you going to, how do you address Terry's point that what you are doing increases the, the, the still slim likelihood of a Tory recovery? You, you, you are, you are, you are on manoeuvres for Rishi Sunak. So in Ilford, so there's two constituencies. Ilford North, I'm not splitting the vote because I'm not standing against Le- with Leanne or against Leanne. No, I know. Leanne no, 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 no. you're splitting the Labour vote. You're, you're, trying to, you're trying to win votes that would have traditionally or, yes. or, or historically have gone to the Labour Party, which means you are essentially operating, you're on manoeuvres for Rishi Sunak's Tory party. Uh, that may well be the outcome, but... Well, I, I just want you to so address th- that, if you would. So I mean, I, I, tell I, me why I'm that's a good idea. Um, I think in the overall scheme of things, given that there's been 10,000 children have been killed, yes. more than 10,000 injured and probably more that are still under the rubble, I think this is one of those points where even if we have to have a conservative government for another whatever number of years and we've gone through so much, I'd rather put up with that than vote for a party that knowingly supporting another regime that's doing this. But you are driving voters to, you are driving voters to a party that's even more explicit in its, or or at least you're driving potential victory towards a party that's much more explicit in its support of the things you were bore. Well, in in Ilford South... I I get it. I mean, I do understand you're prioritising it and you're saying, I don't care if, if what I do delivers this constituency to the Tories because recording my horror at at Keir Starmer's position is more important than who governs this country. And a bit more than that, on the analysis of the outcome of the election, if that Labour are ahead, this may well reduce their majority rather than making it... That's a a fraught business, Mohammed, isn't it? That's a fraught, fraught old business because you you just don't know what the calculation is going to be. And I I, I mean, it is possible you're going to wake up the morning after the election and go, my God, what have I done? You'll be like one of those people who voted for Brexit to send a message to David Cameron and the Tory party and ended up becoming part of the reason why we're the first country in history to impose economic sanctions on ourselves. I don't think I'll be waking up and and sort of be surprised in in quite in that manner. This is a conscious decision. It's a conscious decision because I said the importance and what you are... What if the the Tories have a majority of one? And and, and and if you added your if you added your votes to the Labour candidate, they wouldn't have had a majority at all. Well, there are lots of possibilities, James. You know that, and I know that. And had we known that with Brexit, why at fifty four? So, I, 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 I think we have to stand with our conscience here. I think on this you've, I think you've made your case. I think you've made your case very powerfully, and. Uh, and and uh, as with previous callers, as as with um, uh, your namesake up in Peterborough, I don't, I don't, I certainly, well, I, a, I don't have the brief to defend Keir Starmer from these criticisms, and b, even if I did, I, I don't have the evidence, I don't have the detail. The suspension of Andy McDonald looks pretty hard to justify, and the continuing failure to address these concerns is whether you agree with them or not. That the failure to address them seems clear. 33 minutes after 11 is the time. Thomas Watts is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.37 and it's also Wednesday. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to anybody, but it does mean that PMQs will be with us shortly. Um, uh, Natasha Clark will be joining me just before that in order to um, uh, tee it up. Tee it up. A sort of little aperitif, as it were. Uh, after that, as things stand, we're going to talk to the rather splendid Brian Class about his new book. Brian, one of the great chroniclers of our time. Um, but his new book is, is quite the departure from his traditional territory. And then we will hear from uh, probably our Scottish editor on the question of 
Nicola Sturgeon's testimony in front of the UK COVID inquiry in Scotland today. It, I, I mean, from what I can tell, reading subtitles on screens while talking, it's not going terribly well. And, and she, uh, part of her defence is that she didn't realise she wasn't supposed to delete the messages that she did delete, but they didn't contain anything incriminating anyway because she wasn't using WhatsApp to conduct government business. Politicians and WhatsApp, eh? It's extraordinary. I, I, I don't know that the Labour Party have had a scandal involving WhatsApp, but that's probably only because they haven't been in government. 11.38 is the time. Rifat is in Chingford to steer us back to the Labour conversation. Rifat, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, very um, well. It's. I'm not going to lie. The only word I can find is disappointing. And that's not for Keir Starmer, oh. but that's for, for my community. It is shocking to hear what that last person said that's obviously, you know, standing for Ilford, you know, South and stuff, is knowingly going to support people or to give votes towards people that would, you know, that are support, more supportive of that regime does not make sense. It, it literally does not make sense in any which way. I understand it personally for them, it does, but it's disappointing to hear, and I totally understand all, you know, Asara earlier as well and, and, mm. and her reasons, but everyone is letting emotion cloud their judgment. It's as clear as But that. you can't not be emotional, can you, about the situation? I, I'm emotional. Yes, exactly. I'm emotional, James. But I say, but, but you're not letting it cloud your judgment. No, so, so you're talking about know. priorities, yes, whether they're political or emotional. You, you think we... we you, yes, okay. that, is exact, that is exactly it. Because at the end of the day... To think I'm going to abstain from voting is somehow going to send a message to Labour for them to change something, to try and force their hand to Keir Starmer to apologise or to change his stance or say something different isn't going to make a blind bit of difference. So why waste a vote and potent potentially allow a party to come to stay in power that is systematically destroying this country and the Muslim community as well, the people that we've had in power, Boris, and the things that he said before. Yes. People have incredibly short, uh, you know, <laughs> memories and stuff. And I just can't understand. I'm a father of three as well. I am appalled by everything that's going over in Gaza. Uh, you know, it, it breaks my heart. My cousins, myself, and, you know, and my family, I put things on social media to try and you know, get support out there to get awareness out there. You know, to try and change. But, what, but so you want? So I, I, I'm finding it harder to understand your position than the, than the other one. Actually, the one that you're disappointed in. So let me let me see whether I have. You 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 wish you would like to see Keir Starmer be a little bit more outspoken on this issue, mm -hmm. but that is not a big enough desire for you to even contemplate. Not voting Diluting some of your support for him or, or, or not voting for him. Oh, correct, because the bigger picture... Well, I'm glad you is... said that, because I feel that no, way as well, but I'm not, no. I'm, not, I'm not invested in Gaza in the way that I would be if I, ha if I came from a different background. And, 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 and this is it. It's, it's so important for us, for our children, for everyone else, you know, in our community especially. It might be a minority vote, but it is so important that we use that vote for, people, for, for a party which, you know, has the values that we're looking for, not because of one individual, because if we start doing things like that, we're going to be doing the whole country a disservice. You're going to be doing a disservice to the, to the, to the people in Gaza. You know, you're going to be doing a disservice to your community. You're going to be doing a disservice to your family. And what are they going to say? Like you said, you hit the nail on the head. It's like the Brexit supporter the next morning or someone two years later after the vote going, mm. is this country better? No. And that's what's going to be. How can you live with yourself knowing that this is happening to over in Gaza and stuff, but you've rudimentally destroyed your own children's lives as well and the rest of your community's lives by, by simply letting your emotions... Keir Starmer has to win, and he has to keep everyone on side as much as he can, and that is a very, very difficult thing to do. And right now, the Tories are sitting there loving all of this. They are sitting there and going, we don't even have to destroy Kia. You know, who, who, is he, who, is he, who is he trying to keep on side with the current 
approach to you, this specific well, issue? Who is it? Who is it designed to? I, I'm, I'm going to use the word appease because it's the first uh, one I can think of, but it's not the perfect I, word. I might, I might be totally wrong, but there's a part of me from um, you know, but obviously that ha- happened with Jeremy Corbyn yeah. and all the anti-Semitism and things like that. That Labour were accused of, that the Tories just pounded on consistently on a day-to-day basis, yeah. you know, and that was the fight. That was Jeremy Corbyn's fight to prove that he, you know, the party wasn't anti-Semitic. And he failed. And, every, and he failed completely. And he failed. Exactly, because everyone forgot. Everyone forgot about the actual policies and issues going on at the actual time that we needed to talk about. And instead, the focus was on that. And this is why that failed. And so you, know, you think he's trying too what? hard to avoid to give his enemies any in whatsoever yeah. on 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 tying him to the yeah. anti-Semitic adjacent. Of exactly. Jeremy Corbyn's regime, because I, I, I mean that, that, that I mean Corbyn just did some absolutely indefensible things. Whether it was exactly. offering his support for an obviously racist muralist, or writing a forward for for an obviously anti-Semitic book, or inviting people to the to the to the House of Commons who had records as as ugly as anybody's in that region. Whereas Starmer, you think, is possibly bending too far towards the opposite direction, but yeah, not, he's trying to do a balance, but it's yeah. just. It's it's obviously alienated the, the community because it's such an emotive. So what do you subject. say to the callers that you've heard, like directly to the callers that you've heard today? Because they'll all still be listening. For your kids, for your family, not just for your community. Like the the, the caller, the lady before said, it's yeah. all about community, family. Do it for them. Just vote for the party, not for the person. Yeah, that's what's important. I'm glad you're listening today. I I, I don't always enjoy consensus on the program but some days it seems more important than others to have dissenting voices and and you've you've certainly um departed from most of the previous contributors and and i say you're closer to my position than than they are but i i am not a muslim so this conversation was initially not about voters like me Uh, and and i don't know what he could have done that's the point the Andy McDonald sacking, I think, or the Andy McDonald suspension is in, is indefensible. I, th- I think that was a terrible mistake. And if I was, if Rifat had asked me the question of who do I think he's trying to appeal to, there, my answer would be right wing media. He's trying to insulate himself from any uh, attempts to knit him and his leadership to the leadership of the previous Labour leader, who who which was often anti-Semitic adjacent. I, and I know some people are still desperately unhappy with that description. And I, and I know it's a little bit of a cynical way to, to counter it. But seriously, just read the Jeremy Corbyn chapter in my new book, How They Broke Britain, because anybody claiming that, that he was unfairly targeted on those issues uh, doesn't know the facts um, or doesn't understand politics. Uh, Ed Miliband's dead dad was accused of hating Britain. So if, if you think that they reserved special um approaches for for your man then you just you just haven't been paying attention so yeah i i I think that's a really strong analysis and and starmer's desperation to avoid being tarred with that brush has perhaps led him too far in the opposite direction but under rifat's analysis not so far that you could even contemplate letting the other lot stay in power We've got time for some challenges to that analysis, if, if you are so minded, or indeed for other voices suggesting that it would be um, foolish, catastrophic, to allow this single issue to, to sway your vote in the next general election, to sway your vote away from where it was previously intended. It's 11.46. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Good Lord, it's 11.49 already. Um, lots of love coming in today for uh, the callers in particular. Uh, all of them, in fact. I think you're right. I think it's been an extraordinarily high... I mean, it's always an incredibly high standard on this programme. Um, the highest, I think, in the history of phone and radio. But today has... has, 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 has I mean, it's hard for me sometimes, because if, if callers are all brilliant, I have to concentrate really hard. I can't sort of kick back a bit, have a sip out of my enormous mug of tea or... I have to, especially when we're discussing anything even remotely related to the Middle East, I have to be on absolute tiptoes, tenterhooks, um, because it, it is such a tightrope. And if you're walking across a tightrope, you have to concentrate a lot harder than you do if you're walking across a field. You can write that down if you want. It's almost a proverb. But thank you. The calls have been exceptional, and no doubt they will continue to be so, um, albeit that there isn't time for many more because PMQs is on the horizon and Nicola Sturgeon is giving evidence in uh, in Scotland and Brian Class is coming in to talk to us about his new book, Fluke, um, which, I, I, well, it, it is 
it, it, it's an exceptionally, potentially an exceptionally important book from um, a, an exceptional mind. 11.51 is the time. Back to the phones. Amjad's in Leeds. Amjad, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Thank you for allowing me to come on your station. Say it like that. You make me sound like some sort of bouncer. It's a, f- <laughs> it's a free-for-all, mate. Everybody's welcome. Great. You're, you're a great presenter. Thank you. I, I, just, I just feel that emotions are really high uh, amongst the Muslim community yes. in particular. And I do feel that we've been taken for granted for so long yes. that we do we do really need representation, people that do actually uh, have uh, have our feelings, uh, you know, towards the, the Middle East and, and and our presence in this country. I think Labour and Conservatives, to me, are two sides of the same coin. I think we need uh, independent and different people coming onto on, onto the political arena. Uh, I, I do not believe uh, that voting uh, uh, against Labour and then getting in the Tories is a bad thing. Uh, in the respect, in the respect that uh, I think both parties have a system that they control the the politicians that are elected. There are many people in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party that would have voted against the party, but they're unable to do so because of the party structures. That's why I believe that you need independent people that can best represent the people. But you, the problem I've got, and and I I, I don't mean this in a in a patronising fashion, is that you you sound like. You know, I have a phone in about the next general election and someone rings in to say that we need proportional representation. It's not really an answer to the questions that I'm asking. No, no. James, my view is slightly different. Um, no, I know I'm it's slightly talking. different, but that, that's why I'm speaking of it as being analogous to what... So it, on the question of whether or not Keir Starmer has lost your support over his pronouncements on, on, the, on, the, on the conflict in the Middle East, the answer is yes, is it? Yes. Yes, it is. And yes, it what is. what I, would representation look like that reflected the Muslim community that didn't somehow alienate the Jewish community or, or alienate other? I, I mean, the, the idea of I mean, you, com, com, uh, hang on, the, the idea yeah. of community specific representation is slightly puzzling to me. No, but my view is look. Uh, I was minded to stand in Rochdale in the by-election that's coming up. Yes. I, I gathered support from the community, including the business community and the locals. And I was about to nominate myself or get people to nominate me. But I've stood back because George Galloway is standing. And George Galloway is a very good advocate for the causes in the Middle East, George, including George, the George, Palestinians. George, yeah, I, I had a feeling that you were on um, some, some odd sort of tip. OK, I mean, I'll chalk you up as, as a George Galloway fan, but uh, in many ways, that's, that's the point at which it's, it's a bit pointless listening to you anymore. Why is that? Well, I mean, George Galloway's track record speaks for itself. I, I, I'm not here to give you a crash course in your no, hero. But it's very, ad- but it's, it's all it's out very much a, He's very much an advocate... Uh, he's very much, I'll tell right. you what, Amjad, he's very much an advocate for George Galloway. Yeah, but so are most of the politicians in there. You could say they all well, I think the fellow, who's standing, the fellow for, who's standing for Labour has been running the council for years. So he's arguably done a heck of a lot more for the people in your region than some um, uh, uh, pop, pop, well, I, I suppose he's technically a politician who pops up whenever there's political capital to be made by causing trouble for the Labour Party. But I take, I take your point, I, I, but I, that's why I said I could tell uh, quite early on in your call that you were a bit like one of the people who ring in to say, what we really need is proportional representation when we're having a phone-in about what we feel about the 1p increase on the income tax to, in order to fund the NHS. And I, and I know that's a, a little rude. I'm comfortable with being a little rude to you, but, um, but I won't be any ruder. Thank you, mate. Take care. 11.55 is the time. Uh, Bivyesh is in Harrow. Bivyesh, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, good morning. Um, just a quick call. So I, I've spoken to you before. I'm a Hindu Indian from Tanzania. Um, and yeah, Stam is definitely... In fact, I was a Labour Party member in Harrow. Um, Gareth Thomas is my local MP. I yes. was good friends with him, and all of that is now gone. Okay. Um, over over the Gaza, over the Gaza position, and and you know what over the Gaza position, and you know what made me even more angry is the fact that today um, they've woken up to the fact that there is vote bank politics rather than what's actually happening in. So <laughs> they're more interested in not losing votes than the fact that lives are being lost um, in Gaza through famine. Let, and let through- me let me run one thing by you. 
which mm-hmm. which and, and and you know it's a box fresh this so it may it may fall apart on exposure to sunlight but yeah. literally nothing Keir Starmer does will have the vaguest impact upon what's happening in Gaza. That still doesn't matter. I mean, he's a human rights lawyer. Yes. He, you know, no, but I just, I, mean, I just, I don't he, want, I don't want anyone listening to go away with the idea that if the entire Labour Party called immediately for a ceasefire, it would save a single Palestinian life. So why would they not do it? That, because why, he wants to win the general election. So the general election is more And giving ammunition to his potential critics, which would involve very fallacious, disingenuous and deceitful claims that he was of a piece with Jeremy Corbyn on um, adjacency to anti-Semitism. He is essentially trying to keep bullets out of the guns, of uh, metaphorical bullets out of the guns of his critics. That is why he's pursuing the course that he's pursuing. Uh, he, has, yeah, he has made some terrible mistakes, but you speak as if you think that he could change anything. No, 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 no. I'm not even for a minute suggesting he could change anything. Okay. But he could be more empathetic, which is not the case. The whole Labour Party. I mean, yesterday Angela Rayner was made a fool of by Richard Mayley. Well, well I didn't people, see that. What happened right? to Angela Rayner? I, I saw bits of it on, on social media. Where, well, you can't come you know, on the radio and say she was made a fool of and then say, I saw was, bits of it on social no, no, media. No, no, let me explain. She was, she was saying they're calling for ceasefire without calling for ceasefire. Yeah, right? OK. That's basically. So she got it. Got tangled up with that. Okay, but that's, but that's, 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 that's the nature is, of opposition, isn't it? She can't go against. She might personally want to ceasefire, but it's not the party policy at the moment. Okay, James, let me address the fact that you said if you've got you've got one minute. In. Natasha's here to okay. queue up PMQs, and I don't I don't okay, mean that sure. in a. I don't want to hear what you have to say. I'm just warning you that I wish you all no, time. No, that's fine. Listen, I've I've read history of 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 uh, things done against 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 black and brown people, and I'm sorry. To me, what Labour is doing is no different to the British Assembly that have done before, the Germans have done in Namibia. And as far as I'm concerned, if they lose the election, so be it. So you feel that, that they, they value some lives more than they value others? Oh, 100%. We yeah, now have a shadow of a doubt. That's, that's, that's a have... problem he's got to address, isn't it? That, that is the Absolutely. perception that you have. Speaking, of, I, 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 I nearly said I don't care whether you're a Hindu or not at the beginning because I didn't think it would be relevant to what you were going to say. But it is profoundly relevant to what you're going to say yes. because you're... You're breaking down these um, these distinctions, and and if the Tories get back in, and it is partly due to people like you, what do you say it to is. your children? What do you say to what do you say? Well, what do, what would you say to the children in Palestine, James? Well, that's a completely different question. I don't think the children in Palestine are going to want to have a conversation about the identity of the UK Prime Minister anytime soon, whereas the people no, in the well, UK are. When, when, when the UK politicians start working, so you've got the Tories about... back in. These are these are people who speak that's about ethnic perfect. minorities in 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 explicitly awful terms. <laughs> that's perfectly fine because oh, okay. what does it matter to me whether Biden's in power or Trump's in power? They're both the same. Biden's doing no different to what Trump would do. In, so I, in I think that's so wrong and so 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 wrong. But I, I but who knows? I I, I mean, I, I, as I say, the, certainly in Ukraine there'd be a huge difference, wouldn't there? Uh, Trump essentially boasting about how he'd abandon Ukrainian uh, 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 support, and and Ukrainians are white. So you know, I take I take your point. I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure I agree, Vivyesh. I, although I'm closer to agreeing with you than I was with the last fella. It's coming up to 12 noon. I knew I was jinxing it slightly when I talked about the, the incredibly high calibre of the calls when we came back from the break at 10 to 12. But it is now almost time for PMQs, which means the calibre is um, set to rise still higher, at least from the perspective of the commentary, which Natasha Clark will provide. What are we expecting to happen today? Hello. Sorry, I've not been too much um, into the details of Prime Minister's questions today, so I've just been speaking with the Health Secretary. Have you? So, which what I think about? you may hear more of later. Um, I asked her about whether... Who is the Health Secretary this week? Victoria Atkins. Victoria this Atkins, week. yes. Um, so the great government hair. talking about pharmacy for... Great hair, do you yeah. think? Do you think? No? Say Go on. It, say it no, no, I just... I may have got mixed like up with, I've got to mix that with someone else, okay, I think. I see. Um... So the government were talking today about Pharmacy First, which I, I wonder, wonder if that might come up at Prime Minister's questions because it's quite an easy win for Rishi Sunak to say, look, you can go and get all these things free from your pharmacy. And Apparently his mum was a pharmacist. A you know. He I loves talking you, about it. He absolutely um, loves OK, well, I'm so fascinating though I am in what you've been up to all morning. What do you think is likely, likely <laughs> well, I think to he will mention it, so it was relevant. It was relevant. Um, I, I think for Keir Starmer, an open goal might be to ask him if he's in a, 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 a WhatsApp evil plotters group. Yes. Uh, as per the headlines earlier this week, reportedly that Kemi Badenoch was a part of a, a WhatsApp group called Evil Plotters that could potentially be trying to unseat the Prime Minister. So if I were Keir Starmer, I might read out a few of those uh, reported messages if I could get my hands 
uh, on them. Um, I wonder if um, they will speak about the report that's on the front page of The Guardian that's right in front of you about is the NHS in a state of emergency or not? Um, and obviously the strikes that have been ongoing uh, and Victoria Atkins um, speaking earlier with me was talking about what the government are going to do to try and get those strikes over. But, you know, they are facing real pressure from not just the junior doctors, but the consultants and the nurses even threatening to get back on strike well, as well. Thought, so they th- they thought not they over. were close to the wire, didn't they? I think the consultants yeah. took them by surprise. And the nurses has always been a holding tactic. There's probably a little previous of them to speak as if that yeah. front had finished that that it's that, not that over yet side, for them no, on that, that side of the so dispute I wonder if had ended the nhs story that. is remarkable I, I, well we'll see i mean everything's up for grabs mm-hmm. probably nothing on the middle east though given that they are still singing from very similar yeah but possibly sir keir starmer might want to ask a few questions about what's going on there um mm. he could do that um labor and northern ireland Northern Ireland, yes. I mean, Rishi Sunak, it is, to be fair to him, a win for him. And I'm sure he will want to hail the fact that it looks as if we are on the uh, cusp of going back to uh, Parliament in Stormont after two years of them failing to secure an executive. And I'm sure he will want to... To, to sort of, you know, blow his own trumpet on that one. I'm sure he will mention that. Um, it's also quite a hot week for both parties in terms of business. Um, Rishi Sunak's just convened a business council yesterday and Labour have got more of their plans on business coming up later this week. So they're both vying to be the party of business. And we heard from Richard Wallace, obviously, that pre- previous Lab- uh, to- Tory donor that's now switched to the Labour Party earlier this week. The, the Iceland man. Sorry, did, who, did I say Richard Wallace? I mean, Richard, Richard Wallace, Walker. Walker. Richard Wallace used to be the editor of the Daily Mirror, I think. That would be strange, yes. uh, a very strange well, defection. Be an interesting defection, <laughs> but possibly Richard one Walker made. from Rich, Iceland, yes. Right, yes. I th- is there not some sour grapes there because they didn't sort him out with a safe seat? Yes, the Tories were absolutely raging earlier this week saying, well, actually... You know, he was begging us to yeah. give him a seat and we didn't give him one, so he's gone crying to live yes. instead. I, I, well, I can't imagine that being the heir to an enormous fortune gives you a sense of entitlement or, 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 or a belief that you somehow should have everything laid out on a plate for you. Yeah, I, w- I could imagine them getting into a bit of a spat about that if, if Keir stands up and says, well, my guy's coming over and he says, well, it's only because I refuse to give him a seat. That yes. might be some entertainment for us today. Um, it is three minutes after 12. We will, as ever, cross live to the House of Commons as soon as the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, gets to his feet. Um, we've been discussing this research the Labour Party is undertaking into um, British Muslim voters. I, mm. I, there's nothing there that could work to Rishi Sunak's benefit, I don't think. Uh, in terms of, obviously, the Israel-Gaza conflict, both parties obviously have been trying to, to tow this this line, but you know it, it goes back to the heart of, of what, uh, Keir Starmer said on that LBC interview all those months ago um, about cutting off the right, uh, whether the Israel had the right to cut off food and water. And mm. he got into such a muddle about it. It really has stuck with a lot mm. of people. And they are going, well, if you're not going to call for a ceasefire, and Sir Keir Starmer isn't, they're both calling for what they call humanitarian pauses. They say they're different. Um, it, it is a problem. There's lots of people in the Labour Party that are saying, actually, we do have a real problem. We do really need to reach out to this community and try and reassure them we're still on their side. For Rishi Sunak, I don't imagine it gets him a lot of votes by poking poking a hole in this one. And, I don't and see why what he about would do so. Brexit? Because there is going to come a day when Starmer unsheathes Brexit, isn't there? And 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 waves it at the Tories. But I, I, I mean, I don't know. Well, I presume there is, but thinking about the calendar, maybe he won't. Maybe he'll never do that until the election. Today would be a good day to say, how's it going, lads? That thing you said would cause none of the mm. things that it is now causing. I mean, yeah. He can pin that on Sunak. Sunak voted for it. Ledsom's still a minister. She's she doing the rounds doing this wonderful. morning. Someone's just sent me a tweet of an article. She tweeted... She, oh, hang on, I'll tell you afterwards. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in welcoming the DUP statement about the return of the Northern Ireland executive? <laughs> this is an important moment, and we now need all sides to work together to get Stormont back up and running for the people of Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, I too met the families of Grace, Barnaby and Ian on Monday, um, and it's impossible to express in words the horror that they've been through and continue to go through. We must all redouble our efforts to do everything that we can to help them with their campaign. And of course, Mr Speaker, this week, two young lives, 16-year-old Max and 15-year-old Mason, were taken in Bristol. And I know the whole House will join me in sending condolences to their families and their friends. Mr Speaker, one of the most difficult experiences for any member of this House is speaking to those at the sharp end of this government's cost of living crisis. So nobody could fail to be moved by the plight of the member for (laughs) Mid-Norfolk, 
His mortgage has gone up £1,200 a month. He has been forced to quit his dream job to pay for it. A Tory MP counting the cost of Tory chaos. After 14 years, have we finally discovered what they meant when they said, we are all in this together? <laughs> well, Ms. Mr Speaker, uh, thanks to the mortgage charter that the Chancellor introduced last year, millions of mortgage holders across the country are benefiting from support with their mortgages, because it's important rather than take the approach that the honourable gentleman just did, is actually focus on the practical support in place to help people who do need help. And someone on a typical mortgage is able to now save hundreds of pounds thanks to those uh, reforms. And actually what we have what we have recently seen is mortgage applications now at a multi-month high as a result of confidence returning. But if he really cared about helping people with the cost of living, Mr Speaker, he would actually do more to celebrate and acknowledge the fact that, thanks to our plan, millions of working people will now start to pay hundreds of pounds less in tax from this month's pay slips, Mr Speaker. But we all know that's not a priority for him. He said he wanted to back people with a cost of living, but now he has described tax cuts, I read, as salting the earth. Uh, his shadow chancellor, it seems, is equally confused. In Davos, she said she did back tax cuts, but back here in Westminster, she called them a scorched earth policy. She, she, she obviously can't decide which Wikipedia page to copy this week. Mr Speaker, for every £2 he says he's giving people back, he's taking £10 out of their back pocket in higher tax, and he thinks they should be dancing in the street and thanking him. There are 200,000 people, Prime Minister, just like the member for Mid Norfolk, coming off fixed rate mortgages and paying more each and every month because they crashed the economy. Does the Prime Minister actually know how much their monthly repayments are going up by? Prime Minister, as I said, Mr. Speaker, someone on a typical mortgage of about £140,000 with 17 years left is currently paying around £800 as a result of the ability to extend their mortgage term or switch to a six month only interest only mortgage. They will be able to save hundreds of pounds, and that is someone on the average mortgage, uh, Mr Speaker. But again, again, Mr Speaker, again, I, he says he cares about the cost of living. The thing that would have the biggest impact on everyone's cost of living is the fact that his ideas to spend £28 billion, which we had just confirmed this morning by a shadow Treasury Minister, I heard, confirmed that they remain committed to them, but he has no plan to pay for this £28 billion, Mr Speaker. No, no plan at all. And that's typical Labour economics, because they want to keep the spending but drop the payment plan. And I actually saw at the weekend their former leader, his mentor, was clear that they'll make their sums add up with tax rises on people's assets. Their homes, their pensions, and their businesses. It's the same old Labour Party, Mr. Speaker. No plan and back to square one with higher taxes. Mr. Speaker, they've crashed the economy, mortgages are through the roof, they've doubled the debt, and who thinks he thinks he can stand there and lecture other people about fiscal responsibility? But he did not answer the question. Hundreds of thousands of people are coming off fixed rate mortgages and facing huge mortgage increases. And the Prime Minister won't even do them the courtesy of answering the question. No, he didn't. So I'll ask him again. I was very clear at the beginning, and I mean that my constituents to hear it. If yours don't, please leave. Does the Prime Minister have any idea how much mortgages are going up by this month for those coming off fixed rate mortgages? Prime Minister. Well, again, I'll just point him back to my previous answer, Mr. Speaker, as I went him through. Everyone's situation will be different. As someone on a typical mortgage of around £140,000, who is currently paying £800, will be able to keep their mortgage payment essentially the same by using the facilitations that the Chancellor has put in place. But again, that's what we've done to help people, Mr Speaker. But again, it's incumbent on him to explain to the British public how his, his 
his policy of decarbonising the grid by 2030 is going to be funded? He won't give the answers, but helpfully, the Shadow Energy Secretary popped up at the weekend in an interview in the Sunday Times. He said they don't need a plan to pay for it, Mr Speaker, because, in his words, it will produce real savings and it makes clear economic sense. Now, the Shadow Leader here doesn't want to talk about it at all, but let, let me tell him, I see all these years later, it's the same story. The Right Honourable Member for Doncaster North has carved a promise in stone and everyone else just looks away in embarrassment. Uh, Mr Speaker, he just doesn't get it. They crash the economy, mortgages skyrocketing, doubling the debt. They say, they say they're going to they're gonna max out the government's credit card at the next budget. But he won't. The order. I think the Chief Whip's getting very carried away. He doesn't want to lead everybody for a cup of tea, does he? Come on! They have forfeited the right to be lecturing others about the economy. Somebody coming off a fixed rate mortgage is going to be paying an average of £240 more each and every month. A constant reminder that working people are paying the price for the damage that they've done to the economy. This week, I met one of the employees at Iceland in Warrington, Phil. Uh, I'm sure Phil would be. Order. Mr. Gibson. So, sorry. Mr. Starmer. Order. Order. The vo- same voice keeps appearing again. It won't appear anymore. So, I'm just letting you know now. La- laughing at an employee at Iceland yes. who's struggling Shame. with his mortgage. Shame. He told me that his mortgage is going up by a staggering £1,000 a month, Prime Minister. He doesn't want other averages, other people, other stories. That's what's happening to him. If the member for Mid Norfolk on £120,000 can't afford this Tory government, how on earth can people like Phil? Yeah. Actually, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the management of the economy, Phil and millions I think Phil and millions of people like him are now ensuring that inflation is less than half of the rate that it was when we were talking a year ago, putting more money in the pocket. And thanks to this government, Phil and millions of other workers, not just at Iceland, but across the country, are benefiting this month in their pay packet for a tax cut worth hundreds of pounds for someone on an average salary. But I hope he explained to Phil, he explained to Phil the cost of his policies. Did he explain to Phil, did he explain to Phil how Phil is going to have to pay for his £28 billion green spending spree? How it's going to cost Phil in higher taxes, more coming out of his pay packet, and did he explain to Phil that he'd be better off sticking with our plan rather than going back to square one with him? I would invite the Prime Minister to get in touch with Phil and explain to him how paying £1,000 more on his mortgage is making him better off, because that's not how he feels. He's just so out of touch. It's unbelievable. Finding hundreds of pounds extra a month, that may not seem like a big deal to the Prime Minister. But let me tell him, most people don't have that sort of money knocking around. And if that wasn't bad enough, Mr Speaker, this week he told every council in the country to put their council tax up by the maximum of 5%. That's 26 tax rises now, Prime Minister. And he says everything's fine, people are better off. But when people see their mortgages going up, their council tax going up, food prices still going up. Who does he expect them to believe? His boasts or their bank account? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, again, I, I was puzzled because again he resorts, as always, to the politics of envy here. But after recently, after recently and repeatedly, uh, recently and repeatedly attacking not just me but the government for lifting the bonus cap, I was. Genuinely surprised to see that the Shadow Chancellor just today has announced that she now supports the government's policy on the bankers' bonus cap. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if he mentioned that to Phil when he was having a chat with him, but I'm sure he can, he can fill us up. But I can tell him that trust, trust, and economic credibility come from sticking to a plan. But it's becoming clear you cannot trust a word that he says. 
again, when the Shadow Chancellor says or claims that they won't borrow much, they won't raise Phil's taxes, we now know, we now know that those promises simply again, they just aren't worth the Wikipedia page they were copied from. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I actually didn't expect him to be laughing at Phil. I did not expect him to be laughing at Phil. Not a just oh, oh, oh. I made this statement very clear. I don't want Prime Minister, it's very serious that we make sure that people here, both you and the Leader of the Opposition, it matters to the people who watch the proceedings of this chamber, and it's not good in the behaviour that seems to be carried out. Prime Minister. The Prime Minister just doesn't get how hard it is for millions of people across the country like Phil. That is the primary problem, struggling with their mortgages, their bills, the spiralling cost of living. And the Prime Minister's response is never to take responsibility, show contrition or even any level of basic understanding. He's so detached, he thinks he can paint a world in which their problems simply don't exist. The problem is he can't even fool his own MPs, let alone anyone else. The member for Mid-Norfolk says he's exhausted. He's looking forward to new opportunities outside of Parliament. Why doesn't the Prime Minister do him a favour, call an election, so he and the whole country can move on? Oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. But whether it's Phil, whether it's everyone else across the country, the plan that we're putting in place is working to help people, and we're making progress. Just this week taking action to stop children from vaping. Just this week, ensuring that people can visit their pharmacies to get the health care they need, freeing up millions of GP appointments. And just this week, millions of working people starting to see hundreds of pounds of tax cuts delivered in their pay packet, Mr Speaker. That is a plan that is working. All he's offering is £28 billion of tax rises. And that is the choice, Mr Speaker. It's a brighter future with us, or back to square one with them. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister likes to attend live sport, and so I wonder whether he would join me in welcoming the decision of the planning inspector in upholding Rugby Council's rejection of an application for development at Brandon Stadium in my constituency to keep the doors open for it to remain a sporting venue so that future generations will enjoy the thrills and spills of motorcycle speed, speedway and stock cars. Yeah. 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 Well, I join a my honourable friend in paying tribute and being proud of actually Britain's rich history in the automotive and motorsport sectors. And the stadium that he talks about is a historic motorsport venue. And it, whilst it's been a shame to see it fall into disrepair, I hope that the decision he refers to enables the possibility of both speedway and stock car racing to return. And I know that my honourable friend will rightly continue to champion this cause. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when the Tories scrapped the cap on bankers' bonuses in the autumn during a cost of living crisis, the Labour Party rightly opposed it. Yet here we are, just three months later, and the Labour Party support scrapping the cap on bankers' yeah. bonuses. Shameful. But is the Prime Minister comforted by the fact that he's now no longer alone in this House on being completely out of touch with public opinion. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, as I said at the time, we supported the decision of the independent regulator because this was the right thing for financial stability. But that, Mr Speaker, is because on this side of the House, we have a set of convictions and we have a plan and we stick to it. But he's absolutely right to point out the flip-flopping and U-turning and no convictions of the party opposite. Yeah. Of course, Mr Speaker, scrapping the cap on bankers' bonuses was only made possible due to Brexit. So what the Westminster parties are now telling the public is that it's, it's OK for bankers to have unlimited Brexit bonuses, yep. but for the yep. public sitting at home, struggling to feed their families, they have to suck up and deal with the additional food price costs as a result of Brexit red tape. Yeah, yeah, that is the cost yeah, yeah. and that is the reality of broken Brexit Britain. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it the case that the great achievement of this Tory government is getting the Labour Party to agree to that bleak future? Yeah. Yeah. 
Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we're actually delivering benefits for people across Scotland, not just least in new free trade deals that are opening up markets for Scottish exporters, free ports that are attracting jobs and investment, the Brexit pubs guarantee, cutting the cost of a pint in, uh, in Scottish pubs. But when he talks about the cost of living, Mr Speaker, the thing that he could do most to help is make sure that Scotland isn't the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. Not, and it's not just for high earners, Mr Speaker. Everybody earning £28,500 or more is paying more tax in Scotland than they would in England, thanks to the SNP. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One punch thrown, two days on life support, then three 21 children. minutes after 12 is the time. Um, there it is. We will pick over the bones of what you have just heard after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. We got we got hold of Phil from Iceland. Have we got his number? Has anyone got his number? Has anyone got Phil's number? Have you got Phil? Phil, have you got Phil's number? I'll put some calls. He's, where is he? Warrington. Can anyone get us Phil on the phone? We got to give him. Give, if you know Phil, give him my number. Yeah, oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Tell him, tell him to give me. Imagine if you were Phil. What would you be saying? It's highly unlikely that he was watching know. PMQs, or, or, or maybe he's listening to it while, while working in the stockroom at Warrington, Iceland. What would you think if you were Phil? You'd have that curious mixture of like rabbit caught in a head. What the heck? What it's do I do next? But also complete anonymity because only the other, but everyone else in Iceland's going to no, know who Phil are. is. It's going to be quite a big topic of conversation at Warrington, Iceland today. I said, did you hear about Phil? Oh, Phil on the telly. Phil, it was, it's all about <laughs> Phil. Poor old Phil. Phil, man, I didn't know you were struggling to pay your mortgage. Oh, it's my round Phil. tonight. It's our sort. Yeah. Um, a strange on, one, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, Bill's not on Phil tonight. No. Tough one there, I thought. Um, it got better, but it didn't start very well. It was well. a bit bitty, wasn't yes, well, it? It was a bit were, all over the place. As, as we said, there were no humdingers or obvious ways in. No. So cost of living, with that side you order of a that. Tory minister who can't afford to pay his mortgage. Yes, that's a good way of doing it, yeah. by talking about George Freeman, who said that he was res- he resigned last year as a minister. He said, he's now saying that it's because he could not afford the mortgage rise from £800 a month to £2,000 a month on his ministerial salary of £118,000. Whereas if he reverts to being a mere MP on eighty-six and a half and a half grand, he is allowed to take on lucrative second I'm, Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Jobs. Really, I don't really understand the maths there because obviously he is allowed to well, take Well, if he's on. a lawyer, if he's sure. a barrister, I don't know what he is, but is he, barristers, for example, can make a ton I'm of money not sure if he is a on, the, on the side. Uh, uh, and, you know, even Dominic Raab, who has got the brains of a sofa, can get very lucrative little side gigs off the back of being a former deputy prime minister. So I, pre- I presume he can. I presume he's now going to be... And I haven't checked the register of interest. Should have done that in the break. I'm sure he is now taking on a, another job to pay yes. that mortgage. But well, yes. he's also had a divorce. He had a he had a, a, a tricky divorce in 2014, I think. So, listen, this will make you laugh because you're from a younger generation, Natasha. But I I have some sympathy for him. Don't laugh yet. It's tr- we all take out mortgages that are roughly the most we can afford. Sure. Uh, and yeah. and one of the you know great causes of the 2008 financial crisis was the slightly naive belief that if someone was prepared to lend you that amount of money, then you must be able to pay it back because they wouldn't lend you the money if they didn't think you could pay it back. So even if it seemed like quite a lot of money, you were confident you'd be able to pay it back because otherwise they wouldn't have lent it to you. But yeah. then, of course, reality came to bite and, and the way that mortgages had changed. So I, I have sympathy for someone who cuts his cloth according to... Um, so having certain outgoings and a certain income, to, to paraphrase Mr. McCorber, and then when things go up by that much, mm. when they nearly double, there's that not enough. Lot. You're running out a month before you've run out of money. It's a lot of money. Yes, it is. Even though it starts off in a place that most people can only dream of financially. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think obviously Starmer was, you know, right to go in on yeah. something because I think he's tapped into what you know I think I'm sure will be a key part of the next election is that. He, Labour's argument will be that Rishi Sunak doesn't understand you. He doesn't understand that your mortgage is going up, that your bills are going up, that your food is going up, and that there is a big cost of living crisis that the government has largely been unable to do quite a lot about. And he might be able to point to say, well, inflation's fallen, but you're, their people are still worse off. And that's what I think he's trying to tap into. Um, and, you know, you, Rishi Sunak doesn't get how hard it is for you. And, and it's a tricky position for the government to be in because you've, they've got to project this message of hope and optimism that things are mm. getting better mm. without 
um, essentially without admitting that things are bad. Things are, are pretty bad right yes. now, exactly, That's and they're really acknowledging which really hard balance to strike. Do you think that there is a threshold above which you can't really play the politics of envy card? Because if there is, Rishi Sunak is almost certainly above it. It doesn't quite work coming from mm. him accusing other when you're one of the richest people in the world accusing others of politics of envy doesn't quite work. I don't. Think. It is, and it's obviously something that that he will he will face accusations of mm. in, in the general election. I'm sure that that Labour will will go and say that this guy earns so much money. How can he possibly earn understand the struggles that you're going through um that you know the conservatives argument is well you know he could be earning a lot of money as a banker somewhere else and he's not uh, a a quick, la george freeman yes indeed a quick shout to mark's mum who's just popped down to iceland in warrington to see if she can find phil so oh, we might we you. might be talking to phil before the end of the program Give her a microphone. um i'll read this text as well stephen flynn um making an increasing habit of going after both of the, the major party leaders, which you know shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who understands Scottish politics. It's not surprising at all, but for people who view politics through a Westminster-shaped lens, it can sometimes see a little a, a bit jarring, because it's different from what the previous fella did. Didn't go after Labour anywhere near as much as, as Flynn does, but this text points out that we may be paying slightly higher taxes in Scotland, but we're getting an excellent health service, free prescriptions, additional money for families, baby boxes, NHS dentistry, free travel for young people, and a free university education. Those are quite powerful points. Do so you really. really think the NHS in Scotland is fine? Well, he lives there. We don't. Um, but, the, but, but the rest of the list is, is inarguable. Some, so, some, some fair points there. So but... does Sunak think that works? He clearly does. The, 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 the question about square one, we've talked about this before. My listeners find it very odd that he keeps coming back to this idea that Labour will take you back to square one mm. when most people would think that life in 2024 was worse than it was in 2010. Yeah, we still don't know what square one is and no. where it's taking us back to. Um, and I, I think the Conservatives' argument, which I think is very strong, I think we've, what Rishi Sunak touched on today, was that you can't, you might not be able to trust Sir Keir Starmer. And I think that is a right argument mm. that they should be going into. But this back to square one business, I don't think anybody really understands what it actually means and what it's trying to say. Um, you know, and Keir Starmer is... Again, having to to bat away accusations that he's not trustworthy, that he's a flip flopper, that he changes his mind, that he says one thing to his party and then he says another thing to his MPs, and he's changed his position on a lot of things. And sadly, that is the way of politics. You have to change your mind on a lot of things, and you have to, um, you know, react to the situation. In but obviously, Labour have got in a huge muddle about this twenty eight billion pounds worth mm. of spending, which they have had to row back on. And and they mentioned that um, LB Rishi Sunak mentioned our LBC interview in in one of his answers, um, saying that you know. Th- Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, did support the tax rises and now she's saying it's a scorched earth policy that she's unfortunately going to have to inherit. And it, it is hard because when you're going to go into government, you've essentially got to, to shut up and, and stop making big promises that you can't deliver, especially when public services are, are what they are and the public finances are what they are. Mm. But they must be... I, I mean, We make a mistake sometimes of thinking, well, they must be polling it or they must be focus grouping it and this back to square one thing must be working for them. I, maybe it's not. Maybe they've just got not, not got much else. And I they don't, don't know. Every, every minister that I hear has been it, told to... Well, see, to push here, it. You hear them saying it on the airwaves. It sounds one. like it's something that... That, that is resonating with focus groups and, and I think there is a bit of a risk I think that's what the Conservatives will try to play up in the, in the coming months that there's a risk of going to vote for Keir Starmer I mean there was a caller actually earlier on LBC that said something like better the devil you know and I think the Conservatives will use that and, and play on that and say look you know this guy look you know the other argument for Labour is well better the devil you know but actually it's, it's pretty poor under this devil mm. Well, not not the best PMQs, not the worst. No, it wasn't fantastic, was it? Thank oh. you, Natasha Clark. Twelve thirty-one <laughs> is the time. Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Twelve thirty-five is the time. Any any word from Phil? Have we got anyone? Has Mark's mum found Phil yet? But he might be out at the back. He might be out the back. He might be on bins this week. I don't know what, what he's on today. He might be on bins. If we can get a hold of Phil at Warrington, Iceland, we'd be very, very grateful. In the meantime, I'd have to make do with Brian Class. <laughs> Talk about a booby prize, Brian, of course, <laughs> is the Associate Professor in Global Politics at, at University College London. Um, and, and, and an author of several books, the most recent of which we will talk about shortly. But, but your last book, Corruptible, was about why the wrong people kept kept getting into power, and it was it was a tour de force. It was, a, it was an extraordinary book. A bit a bit like me, you find yourself addressing issues that you wish weren't happening, but you, you're driven to try to understand them. Where, where are we 
sitting now with regards to American politics? Uh, it, I mean, it, it could be argued that the lessons of your book have not been heeded. <laughs> yeah, I mean, indeed, uh, it's disastrous. I think I think that we're headed towards a world in which the Republican nominee for president is going to be going on trial for 91 felonies and might still win. And it's not actually illegal or unconstitutional for someone to be president from prison. So uh, that will be an extraordinary thing to experience if that happens. But I, you know, I mean, American politics, you know, I, I look as I've, I've been here for 12 years in the UK mm. and I feel a little bit like I, I left one sinking ship for another in some ways. And um, uh, the one thing that does make me feel good is that the US is much more broken than Britain is. So I think that's a, a consolation prize you won't want to celebrate, but one nonetheless. Is it therefore not a coincidence, whether it was conscious or not, that, that your new book, your latest book, Fluke, is not specifically a political book? Yeah, it's, I think it's about bigger questions of why things happen. Mm. I mean, that would probably be the the accurate title, but fluke, uh, you know, sort of rings a little bit better. Um, you know, I, I think I've been grappling with all these questions of what ifs. And, and, you know, there's all these things with whether it's Brexit or Trump where you can imagine what ifs. I mean, there's this story that Trump decided to run for president in 2011 when Barack Obama told a joke about him yes. at the White House Correspondents' Dinner that humiliated him. And so, you know, you can wonder how many people's lives were affected, you know, sometimes tragically by the Trump presidency, and maybe it hinged partly on a joke, or 70,000 people voting one way or another in three states in the 2016 election. So I think these questions of what ifs are central to the premise of fluke. How, how do you extrapolate from that? I, I, or how do you guard against sort of counterfactuals? Because nothing that you attribute to a fluke it's very hard to prove that it is attributable to a fluke. So how do you move from that perfectly understandable? And I know that one interview has already made the point I thought I was going to be very clever and make about a butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazonian jungle. How do you get a whole book out of that? I mean, wh wh where does the thesis come in, the, the, yeah. the, the intellectual side of it? Yeah, so what I'm basically doing is I'm applying chaos theory to humans. And the opening story of the book is looking at a vacation that a couple took in 1926 to Kyoto, Japan, yeah. where they fell in love with the city. And, you know, normally a vacation doesn't change the world, but 19 years later, the husband from that couple ends up as America's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. And the target committee, which is deciding where to drop the first atomic bomb in 1945, picks Kyoto as their top target. So Stimson springs to action and twice meets with President Truman and gets him to take Kyoto off the list. So Hiroshima gets bombed because of a 19-year-old vacation. And the second city, Nagasaki, gets bombed because the original target, Kokura, is briefly covered with clouds at the time that the bomber arrives. So it circles and then has to go to the secondary target before it runs out of fuel. Now, the, the, the point is that the world has always worked like this. There are all these little moments that divert history and divert our lives. And I think there's lots we can all look at our own lives and see these little flukes that change things. I think the difference is that we've made the world more prone to flukes. I right. think that's one of the issues that we're, we're having to grapple with today. The 21st century is basically a series of unforeseen calamities. I mean, from 9-11, the financial crisis, the Arab Spring, started by a guy lighting himself on fire in central, uh, central Tunisia, Brexit, Trump, the pandemic, you know, mm. a single person getting infected with a mutated virus. So I think we've engineered systems that are at the absolute limit. And this why, is why, why have we done that? Because we alter at the, uh, we worship at the altar of efficiency and optimization. So we're maximizing profit eff exactly. effectively and, yes. and having things in place. Do you know what a gully sucker is? No, <laughs> but I'm about to learn, I think. <laughs> so it's just everyone's shaking their heads. It's one of my, I think this is the big political explanation that, that the world needs. A gully sucker is a big engine that councils employ to suck debris out of gutters. And they're obviously not used very often. You can double it up as a snowplow if you want. But when they're trying to cut costs, they get rid of the gully suckers because mm -hmm. they're only using them for a few months of the year. And that is one of the reasons why we now get so much more flooding. So the gully sucker principle plays a part in what you're describing, doesn't it? That because is a, we, we, the, the fluke of a flood yes. actually is part of the backdrop to creating a world in which flukes have become more likely. And what I love about this is hmm. that the fluke is not unforeseen in the sense that it's yeah. actually an inevitable byproduct of the system design. So, you know, a couple of years ago, a, a gust of wind hit a boat and it turned it sideways and lodged it in the Suez Canal, yeah. right? It caused $54 billion of economic damage because there's no resilience set up into our systems today. So accidents have always happened. They've always changed history. What I'm worried about is that we've set up a world where Starbucks will never change, but you know rivers dry up and democracies yeah. collapse. And I think wow. the argument of fluke is that this is something where the optimization principle, which is in general good, has been so, so fetishized that you end up producing a lack of resilience. 
And so I, you know, I worry that what we've done is embedded systemic risk into our world at the sort of short-term uh, goal of, of efficiency and optimization, but the long-term cost of resilience. Where, where did the idea come from, Brian? Yeah, so th- this, is, this is where I tell a story in the introduction of a, a, a tragic story from 1905 in a little farmhouse in rural Wisconsin. And a woman has a mental breakdown. She's got four young children, and she has a mental breakdown and, and kills her kids and then takes her own life. And her, her husband comes home to find this horrific scene. And the reason it's in the introduction to Fluke is because this is my great-grandfather's first wife. And he came home, found the whole family dead, and eventually remarried to my great-grandmother. Now, I found this out in my mid-20s, mm. and you know, I realized that I'm a cosmic accident. I think all humans are, but I think I'm, you know, this, this tragedy is, gives you a visceral sense of being a cosmic accident, a fluke, basically. And I think this is the aspect where when you bring these principles into your own life, you start to realize that there's a lot of arbitrary forces that are affecting our trajectories. I mean, you wouldn't be listening to my voice if these children didn't die 119 years ago. So I, I think that principle is one that actually is, is somewhat uplifting because there's unforeseen ripple effects with everything we do. And it also means that a lot of the worst moments in our life are inextricably linked to some of the best ones because I'm the byproduct of a mass murder. So, so it, it, I, for want of a better word, it, 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 understanding this, fully appreciating this, or at least appreciating this more deeply, this, the, the role of fluke, it could give you a more zen approach to your own existence. Well, it has for me. I mean, I, I, this is the only thing I've worked on where I changed my worldview in writing it. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's something where I think I feel a lot less control. I have this line in the book where I say we control nothing, but we influence everything. I think it's a much nicer way to live. And it's also a nicer way to understand our, our politics and our world, because I think this sort of this obsession with control where we can always, you know, do everything, manipulate everything, et cetera, ends up backfiring all the time. And, you know, the way that our politics works is basically people who are <laughs> never uncertain but often wrong yes. tell us, here's how you fix it, and then it blows up in their face, and we keep doing the same thing. And I think that principle of losing a little bit of your hubris and accepting a bit more experimentation and limits of control actually is a lesson that the world would be wise to heed. Uh, empathy as well. It's, yeah. a, it's an engine of empathy, isn't it, to, to imagine the, the sliding door yes. having delivered you to somewhere else. The most important things in my life I had zero control over. Where yeah. I was born, when I was born, who my parents were, uh, how my brain was structured. All, I mean, all, I had nothing to do with any of this. So I think one of the other lessons is you sort of accept that you should take a little less credit for your success and a little less blame for your failure. So I, I saw Charlton Heston being interviewed once, uh, many years ago, before he did the mad NRA speech about his cold dead hand, where we all still thought of him as Ben Hart. Do you know this story? Yeah, no, not the story, oh, but I've seen the, the video. Yeah, you'll love this story. Okay, so he he was talking about the moment in his life when everything changed, and it was when he was driving off the lot uh, at MGM or wherever in Burbank, and Samuel Goldwyn or, or one of the he was, he was driving his car and he was trying to wave to a security guard. So he was leaning right out of the window, waving at the security guard on the other side of the lot or saying goodbye to a friend. And that was the moment that the mogul saw him in the chariot and gave him the part. That's when he said, that's our Ben-Hur. That's the guy we're going to put in, in Ben-Hur. And th- the interview I watched, which was on the old Wogan program, he introduced me. I was very young when I saw it. He introduced me to the word serendipity, mm. which is fluke. It is. Of a good kind. <laughs> isn't it? And that, that changed Charlton Heston's world. It changed his life completely. But I, re- I always remember that. It resonated with me as a young man because he was completely doing what you just described. Mm. He was completely acknowledging the role that dumb luck had played in his extraordinary success. Well, and the, the amazing thing about this is that we all have these moments in our own lives, but they're only a very small portion of the flukes that, that exist because we can only see some of them, right? I mean, the sliding doors effect is one in which our lives are constantly diverting in these different paths that we'll never know how it could have unfolded differently. And so, you know, somebody asked me what's the most important fluke in my life. The mm. answer is I have no idea. Of I'm course. sure that I was almost killed at some point. Yes, yes, and yes, I, yes. I wasn't. Yes. You know, I mean, I was on a car and, and somebody, you know, woke up before they rammed into, you know, they fell asleep at the wheel and I would never know that. So I think the, the really bewildering thing about this that I find personally uplifting is that every moment is, is important in a way that you can't contemplate but actually does divert your lives. And I think the way that we make sense of the world, and this is true for punditry and politics, is that you always stitch together a neat and tidy story, mm. right? We, I, you know, I go on the airwaves sometimes and like the three words I can't say are I don't know. Mm. But mm. often I don't know. 
And I think that's one of the things where we always have to come up with a, a narrative to explain things. And the, the beauty of accepting flukes is that sometimes there is no neat and tidy narrative and you just sort of enjoy life a bit more. Uh, it's liberating. It is. It can be liberating. Yeah. Um, I, 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 final question, because it may have popped into people's heads listening to us talk, listening to you talk. How, how did you impose structure how did you get a book, a structured book, out of what could have been very sort of random, disparate thoughts and ideas heading off in a million different directions? Yeah, well, I, I tried to draw on every possible realm of thought of people who have thought about this question. So there's evolutionary biology, philosophy, history, a bit of physics in the book, as well as social science, which is my own world. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are asking this question. I mean, it's the biggest question there is. Why? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there's actually some really interesting insights from these different groups of people that don't talk to each other. So uh, what I was trying to do yeah. with Fluke is to synthesize this and say, look, you know, our politics can learn from the world of evolutionary biology. Uh, we can learn from physics and so on. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's difficult. I don't know if I succeeded, but it's something where I, I, I really learned from it. And now I've also learned what a gully sucker is. So how can, <laughs> how can that be bad? I can go in the yeah. sequel, can't it? Um, it, it, it what, what section of the bookshop do you think it's going to be filed in? <laughs> I have no idea. Because you need <laughs> to be careful of this, <laughs> seriously, because booksellers need a bit of help knowing yeah. where to put stuff. I, well, I'll find out tomorrow because it's in Waterstone, so I'll go and look and uh, figure well, that, out what no, they did. For the first few weeks, you'll be fine. You'll be on the big tables out the front. You'll probably push mine off, actually. I've had a, go I've had I don't a good run. I'm, I'm happy to make way, but I don't know what's, I don't know where I put it. Yeah, I have no it idea. It won't go next to your old book, will it? To yeah. your last book, to Corruptible, no. which just goes straight up. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a tour de force. I've only just started it. I, thought, I actually thought you were coming in next week, but I can tell that I am going to finish it, um, and I urge everybody else to have a look. Just, just It's odd, isn't it, how sometimes understanding things can be liberating and sometimes understanding things can be quite depressing but this is very much in the former category as opposed to the latter category I find it incredibly uplifting I hope other people yeah. who read it do too we'll I, see yeah. um, Fluke by Brian Klass spelled K-L-A-A-S Brian Klass Fluke is published by John Murray Harback and it will be out already albeit that it, it, it's not officially published until tomorrow it will be out in bookshops now and available in all the usual online outlets congratulations thank you so I much I gather I hear that it's already doing the business in America that it must is, be very gratifying. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Because academics aren't meant to sell large numbers. Of <laughs> this, this is indeed true, but uh, I, I hope I buck the trend. You're we'll see defying the natural order, or is it just a fluke? Exactly. It's 12.48. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.51 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where um, a, a first minister, not a prime minister, but a political leader during the COVID crisis is having a rather tricky time um, regarding the WhatsApp function on their phone. Uh, I speak of, of Nicola Sturgeon, who, like Boris Johnson, is no longer in the chair, but nevertheless remains a focus of considerable interest at the ongoing COVID inquiry, which has um, turned its attention to Scotland today and indeed to her. Gina Davidson is LBC's political editor in Scotland. Um, we should begin by, by catching up on precisely what's happened, Gina. Yes, James, Nicola Sturgeon uh, has been really grilled by Jamie Dawson Casey. He's the inquiry's counsel while it's here in Edinburgh. Of course, it's not her first rodeo in front of uh, inquiries or, or committees, but she has seemed very nervous at times. And we also saw her on the brink of tears at one point, which I think took a lot of people watching by surprise. Now, this was when the inquiry council um, was asking her about her suitability to be first minister during the pandemic and that followed on from him asking a very similar question about Boris Johnson's suitability to be Prime Minister during Covid. He said it had been suggested by witnesses that he was the wrong Prime Minister for this crisis and asked if that was a view she shared. Now, we know, James, that she described him as a clown in a message that the inquiry has already seen. And today she said it wasn't betraying any secrets that she thought Boris Johnson was the wrong person to be Prime Minister, full stop. But when she was pushed on her own suitability to be First Minister, to be leading the country through the pandemic. She got incredibly emotional. I think we can hear uh, what she had to say on that. Did you consider yourself against that background and your considerable ministerial experience to be precisely the right first minister for the job? No, that's not how I would have thought of it at all. Um, I was the first minister when uh, the pandemic struck. There's a large part of me wishes that I hadn't been... Um, but I was, and I wanted to be the best First Minister I could be during that period. It's for others to judge the extent to which I succeeded. 
Now, Crikey, a lot quite, of this um, morning's... Oh, that, sorry, that, that, James. Yes, you're right. That took me by surprise as well. That, 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 <laughs> I, mean, I suppose you'd have to describe it as, 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 as raw humanity on display, would you? Yes, I think so. And I think what's quite interesting is coming from Nicola Sturgeon, it's something you you, you don't really ever no. see. I mean, there were times during the, 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 the pandemic when um, you thought she you could tell that she was under a great deal of pressure and under, under stress. But, um, you know, that kind of shakiness in the voice, that, that kind of emotion, it's very unusual coming from her. She's generally mm. a very pulled together kind of person. But she's under a lot of pressure here, James, and uh, particularly about the the culture of the Scottish government, you know, if she really was the one making all the decisions that she had too tight a control and that the cabinet was just a kind of uh, rubber stamp on decisions that she had already made about uh, what was going to happen around restrictions and so on. Now she was denying this. She said the cabinet was absolutely where decisions were made and that all of those discussions were, were minuted, although she did have to admit that um, so-called gold command meetings, something which she said she was quite embarrassed about, that title uh, that had been put on these meetings by the civil service these were a much smaller group of people in a room where they decided what options were going to be put to cabinet to be discussed and then to be decided upon and these meetings were not minuted and she was also asked you know why Kate Forbes who was finance secretary at the time wasn't invited to meeting these particular meetings when they were discussing things like finance and furlough and how you know putting res further restrictions on would impact the economy um, she said you know with hindsight that she, she probably should have had her at those meetings and she was also being put very much on the spot James about informal messaging this yes. use of WhatsApp which we've heard time and again throughout this COVID inquiry uh, she has had to admit that she didn't retain any of her messages uh, there was a bit of back and forth with the council on that he was saying you've deleted them she said well I didn't retain them you know and ev eventually he said you deleted them and she said yes but she said that was uh, the government policy at the time and that anything that was salient within those messages was put on the corporate record but as uh, Jamie Dawson has pointed out to her and to others who have not retained their messages um, no, nobody can decide that now nobody can find out for sure whether or not uh, what was put on the corporate record was really what was discussed and who was discussing it. So we've got another full afternoon of this from Nicola Sturgeon. Um, so we'll see how she gets on. But I think we'll hear much more uh, about that relationship between her and Boris Johnson and the UK government as a whole uh, during the pandemic. And, and oddly, I, what we will hear will be areas of divergence and, and but, but often fairly profound dislike or disagreement. And yet there's a fairly clear parallel there with the London branch of the inquiry when... The, the politicians deciding what and was not salient and claiming that they only deleted the stuff that wasn't relevant or wasn't important, but leaving the public and indeed the inquiry to, well, either to take it on trust or to, or to respond with a degree of scepticism. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Jamie Dawson, the KC, has described uh, the lack of minutes for these goal command yeah. meetings, for instance, as being somewhat mysterious. You know, um, he, he, he obviously is very sceptical about the fact that messages weren't retained or, or were deleted. We have had some uh, of Nicola Sturgeon's messages because other people that she was communi communicating with did save them, James. So, right. for instance, Liz Lloyd, her former chief of staff, has handed over some messages. And in fact, in some of those today, we saw that the pair of them were discussing what should happen around um, hospitality reopening. Uh, should uh, you know pubs and restaurants be allowed to sell alcohol at six in the evening or at eight in the evening? And you know, real kind of um, minutiae, the, the real detail of what should happen. And, she, and Nicola Sturgeon saying, well, that was just a discussion ahead of a cabinet meeting I was going into. No decisions were made there. She keeps falling back on this idea that these messaging systems, any kind of informal messaging, weren't used for decisions yes. and that was all done at Cabinet. But I think that is exactly what Jamie Dawson is, is picking away at. So all to play, well, still uh, lots of reasons to, 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 to stay tuned. Gina, thank you very much indeed. Gina Davison, LBC's editor, political editor in Scotland, um, bringing you up to date with what's been happening with Nicola Sturgeon's appearance at that inquiry. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player. The official LBC app where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it for free now from your app store or, or get it from globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it is, of course, Tom Swarbrick, but now it's Sheila Fogarty. Thank you, James. James O'Brien on LBC.